we can start you can say ayub sir uh, uh, sir uh, honorable vc will make one opening just to one or one minute because our international speaker is new and good morning good afternoon and good evening to all the participants from various parts of the world as a vice chancellor of kerala university of health sciences i am extremely happy and proud to welcome you all to the third day of five day webinar on covid-19 in kerala situation and challenges 18 months are over after the first case of covid appeared in india the country and the state are in various stages of the second wave most of the states other than kerala have now lesser number of cases unfortunately the cases in kerala are not reducing in the early days of sars covid 19 we had no knowledge about the nature of the disease will it have a long term effect will it affect various systems how to tackle all these systemic manifestation we didn't have any knowledge but after 18 months a lot of scientific literature is available now however many areas are still gray continued research is needed in all these areas to discuss all these aspects we have dr elenor wilson associate professor from the institute of human virology at maryland university usa she will be speaking to us on post covid challenges for the clinician thank you ma'am for accepting our invitation thank you so much for inviting me and dr kunamal thank you so much for that introduction and thank you everyone who has who has joined in no matter what time it is where you are i will try to make it interesting and informative i am pretty informal so please you know put a question in the chat or or please stop me if i say something that doesn't make sense or if you have questions um you know i think we have all learned how insidious this disease is and how quickly it can travel and we are learning in real time how it works how to prevent it how to treat it and so what i'm going to share with you today about long covid is is still very preliminary um but there's a lot of a lot of things we do know and a lot of things we are still learning and so i'd love to talk with you about that i'm going to try to share my screen let's see um oh goodness and you'd think this far into the pandemic and doing things virtually i would be better at this and so i apologize let's see all right can you see my slides i hope okay so today i'm going to talk about challenges in the management of post covid syndrome which goes by a lot of names uh, long covid is sort of i think the the shorthand that most of us are familiar with and so i'll kind of say that but um i want you to be aware that that there are a lot of different things this can mean this is actually an image taken uh the background is an image taken from the johns hopkins uh covid dashboard which i think is one of the early websites that was really tremendously useful in this in this pandemic you know all of us who do who do clinical and translational research you know have really come to appreciate how important the the evolving nature of the ways that we share data has really has really driven our responses and our knowledge of this pandemic and so i think that was one of our early resources and i would like to shout out to them for for their um excellent work all right so by the end of this talk hopefully you'll know a little bit more about the common symptoms of long covid syndrome or pasc which is post acute sequelae of sars cov2 infection um or pasc for short but again long covid is just easier for me to say and also understand some of the prevention strategies and therapeutic approaches to pasc and and you know as i've said this is preliminary we do not know a ton we are learning but we have some ideas and we have some approaches that i think um that i think will be helpful conflicts of interest i am co-pi of an r21 grant looking at long-term neurologic effects following covid 
which is really something I just kind of happened into. We were doing a study and our, our um, clinical research unit didn't want to see patients who were actively infected to decrease the risk to our own, uh, our own employees. And so we were looking at really recovered COVID. And then when these reports of long COVID came out, we were sort of primed to study those patients. So I've seen a lot of them and I'll share one of their stories with you. I'm also a sub eye on a vaccine trial for Janssen and I'm happy to, I'm not going to be discussing that, but I know that there was a snafu with your, um, with the talk about vaccine and vaccine mixing studies yesterday. So I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end, if you have questions. All right. So moving forward, um, Let's start with a case. I'm a clinician and I always like to use a case to demonstrate something. So we're gonna talk about a 49 year old gentleman who had shortness of breath. This is a 49 year old Hispanic American man who presents with seven days of progressive shortness of breath. After he started having the shortness of breath about three days into that, he had a productive cough, pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath with, particularly with exertion or, or uh, chest pain with exertion. exertion. He brought a home oximeter, which you can now get over the counter at CVS for, for about a hundred bucks, um, maybe a little less now. And it showed that his oxygen saturation was 68%. And he thought to himself, that doesn't sound right. And I will go to the emergency department for a recheck. When he got into the emergency department, he was complaining, oh, sorry, the formatting was a little strange, but he got into the emergency department, was complaining of some chills, sweating, sore throat, the same cough and shortness of breath that, it had, that he'd had that had brought him in, and some chest pain and some, some muscle aches. He denied any fever at home, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or rash. His past medical history is really just significant for um, non-insulin dependent diabetes. His hemoglobin A1C isn't too terrible. He's got, got slightly high sugar. He's on some medication for his diabetes and then something for his cholesterol. He's married but separated, sexually active with women, lives with his adult daughter. Um, he does not smoke or drink alcohol and he works as a truck driver. All right, so on physical exam, he didn't have a fever, maybe low grade, 99.1, very, very mild. His weight is high, he is, he is overweight. His heart rate was fast at 112 while sitting in the emergency department. Blood pressure was fine, but he was breathing 24 times a minute and his oxygen saturation was not that far off from the one that he'd measured before. It was 72%, which is too low. In, in general, he was in some distress. He was breathing quickly. He could not speak in full sentences. He could really just get three to four words out at a time. But on physical exam, other than that fast heart rate, there was really not a whole lot. His white blood cell count was not elevated. His hemoglobin was, not, um, was a little bit low, but not terrible. And his blood sugar, we already knew he had diabetes. And, and especially when people with diabetes can be a little bit sick, then his blood sugar was a little bit high. But otherwise, nothing really tremendously abnormal, except for that chest x-ray, which you can see over here on the right. If you're used to looking at these, they should be more black than that. You know, This white here in the lungs really shows us that he had a lot of infiltrates and, and inflammation. And this really kind of explains some of why he was unable to catch his breath. Um, let's see. Um, Let's see. So moving forward, we did get a CT scan to really get a good look at that, uh, that infiltrate. And you can see here just three representative cuts showing that this is really a very diffuse, very fluffy infiltrate. You can see it ranges from everything from sort of ground glass opacities, this sort of very fine infiltrate over here to, um, to these more kind of plural based and almost, you know, nodular looking kind of appearances you can see that it really affects every single lobe and really every single part of the lung. It doesn't spare centrally. It is very centrally located, but it also accumulates in the periphery. So just very diffuse sort of global infl inflammation. All right, so this is not that, uh, I promise I'm not trying to trick you here. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, influenza, B, para-influenza, which we've actually seen a couple cases of recently, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV? Is this a rhinovirus or is this SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19? Any guesses? <laughs> you can just put it in the chat. All right. This is not a diagnostic dilemma. This talk is about COVID. This is just a very typical presentation we would see of somebody with risk factors for severe COVID. The man has diabetes, he's obese, he has poorly controlled blood sugar, he, um, he's over the age of 40, which is an incremental increase of the risk. And this all happened back in January before the vaccines were really readily available. So this gentleman was unfortunately just a prime setup. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about COVID on the ground here. And this is, uh, 
This is the door that they put up with sort of a temporary wall that was in our ICU to, to sequester our COVID patients from our other patients. Unfortunately, COVID sort of rapidly took over that space. They actually ended up taking this down. But, but I think one of the things about this, because the recommendations for COVID are really that you sequester and isolate and socially distance and minimize your, your contact with others, I think the COVID pandemic can really look like this door. You know, you see it through you know, through glass and you hear about it and, and it can be hard to sort of see it. So I'm gonna try to, to make this a little more real to you. These are, you know, some pictures here from our hospital of what we've seen in response. And I know these images will be familiar to you as well. I mean, people are scared. Providers in particular are scared and trying to protect themselves so they can continue to care for patients, protect themselves so that they can continue to, to not be infectious for their family. So this is actually my friend, Dr. Andrea Levine, who is one of our ICU doctors. And you can see these are some of the images she's taken of uh, patients who are in isolation, patients being transported, patients being intubated so that we can try to protect, protect our providers. So this is really kind of what it looks like behind that door. So this is the history of coronavirus infectious disease 2019, COVID-19. And this is sort of showing you the initial stages of the pandemic. And you can see these initial sort of cases here outside and inside China. You can see this sort of initial spike. This is in uh, late December, or sorry, in January of 2020. And you can actually see then uh, the cases in China kind of trailed off and then the, uh, the cases picking up outside China. Um, sorry. Um, here you go, you can see this in the spike in February as testing increased and then uh, cases outside China. This is cases globally and this is kind of broken down by area. So you can see that that, that graph we looked that was so striking here is actually just a very small blip on this graph here when you look at sort of this early case. These, these are the cases that we were just looking at at that graph, so scale really matters. And you can see as uh, as we're sort of more than halfway into 2019, this is where we are over here on the right in this sort of, you know, I know Carol is in the, the second wave and uh, here in the US, unfortunately, we're in sort of what we are now calling the third wave. This thing just continues to travel around and catch us unaware. Um, and then this is COVID deaths. You can see that, uh, that there's really been tremendous mortality related to COVID. Um, here's that dashboard I referenced earlier, the Johns Hopkins dashboard. Um, you can just Google it and it is tremendously helpful in looking at where cases are now and where they have been. And it's a good track, you know, so right now this was, uh, I checked just about a week ago. And, and when I was preparing these slides in almost 200 million cases at that time, now we've topped out over 200 million, unfortunately, throughout the world. All right, so this is where the what the pandemic looks like where I am here in Maryland. You can see uh, newly reported cases over here on the left and we're in this sort of start of, goodness, I can't even count exactly how, which wave this is. Um, but you can see broken down by our um, by the sort of acuity. So total cases are shown here in gray and you can see that total cases are starting to go up a little but they do remain lower than where we were but the acuity of the patients is, is high. A lot of those patients have been admitted and, um, and then many of those patients are actually in the ICU. And this is what daily infections and testing looks like. This is where we are sort of, uh, when I was putting these slides together uh, about a week ago, and then these are the predictions that if everyone, um, that if everyone wears a mask, or if everyone, if there's 100% mask, you can see what it would be here in green, what they sort of think will happen, and then the worst case scenario shown here in, in red, sort of for planning about uh, lockdowns and restrictions and things. All right. So we know a lot about COVID, and we know that at this point from studies, you know, from exposures and contact tracing, we know that about 80% of cases will be mild to moderate, may even be completely asymptomatic. You know, some people can absolutely have this virus and not be aware of it, not be aware of the symptoms, but still be infectious to others. And that has been a large part of what's been so hard to control. And what really differentiates it from this SARS version one um, epidemic back um, in the early 2000s. We know that about 15, 13 to 15% of patients will be severe. And by that, we mean they will be short of breath. They will have tachypnea like our patient. They will have decreased oxygen saturation. They will have low partial pressure of oxygen or lung infiltrates in more than 50% of lung fields within the first couple of days of, of their presentations. Um, and we know that about five, five to six percent, or maybe one in twenty, will present with critical illness, and that will lead to respiratory failure, septic shock, multi-organ dysfunction failure, renal failure, other other kinds of problems. And we know that the 
crude sort of unadjusted case fatality rate of all comers of COVID is really somewhere around probably two to 3%, but that broader sort of 90% confidence intervals of 1.5 to 4% case fatality rate. And this is in contrast to other COVID infections. So we can see here previous COVID epidemics with SARS being the more morbid of those, particularly you can see in, in higher age groups, in older age groups. And here COVID, even though it is lower, um, overall with a lower case fatality rate. It also, along with these other uh, coronavirus infections, seems to really vary by age with older pe people being much more susceptible to mortality due to this infection. So um, while it is apparently, or apparently less fatal than MERS and SARS version one, it is also more widespread because asymptomatic spread is possible. And then also because there are other animal reservoirs that can perpetuate this virus. All right, so the typical clinical course, and this is really taken from some of the early data in Wuhan um, from the from sort of early 2019, you can see that that survivors and non survivors initially both sort of had these five days of fever and cough. And then people tended to after sort of five days get worse. That's when they developed the shortness of breath. That's when they developed other kinds of organ system dysfunction. And, uh, and then another five days after that is when people would start to require ventilation and ICU admission. You can see that here in sort of the green and red. And then after five to six days, people either sort of got better here or, um, or would succumb and die. Um, and so we can, we can sort of see that that's sort of what we'd see. We often see clinically that people have these sort of, um, the disease can be divided into sort of thirds. There's sort of the initial phase with the fever and cough, then they develop the shortness of breath and they can become acutely ill or get better. And that's kind of what we will see clinically. A lot of times we'll see people in sort of these first, you know, sort of second phase that kind of second five days and they're like no no I'm feeling much better and we were like yeah but we still need to monitor you because this is when people can get worse so it's if somebody initially presents with a fever and cough and they're sort of feeling better you need to kind of keep an eye on them because they can they can get worse all right when I've mentioned this before but the cases and deaths really seem to stratify a lot by age age is a tremendous predictor in how mortal uh, how fatal this infection is likely to be younger people will often recover although uh, there are definitely pre-existing conditions like obesity and diabetes that seem to worsen the prognosis but particularly once you get above 60 uh, or 70 or 80 then you it becomes quite um, quite dangerous in fact with the case fatality rate approaching almost 35 percent when people people are over the uh, age of 80. So if we want to protect those more susceptible in our population, we really need to decrease the number of people who have this infection overall, because those who are susceptible can be tremendously susceptible. All right, so going back to our 49-year-old gentleman who presented with shortness of breath, I just want to tell you a little bit about his clinical course with COVID. So he presented to the emergency department on January 18th and was initially started on oxygen tested positive. He started steroids, which was our, our main treatment at that time. He and then was admitted to the ICU, had increased work of breathing and required high flow nasal cannula and more, more intensive respiratory support. And at that time he was able to access remdesivir. He actually required two days later intubation. He just became too fatigued to continue breathing on his own. So he was intubated and mechanically ventilated. Three days after his intubation, he actually developed fevers and we cultured his sputum and found out that he had a, a superimposed uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. So he received treatment for that. And he had a prolonged course. So he was intubated for quite some time and actually required a tracheostomy so that we could slowly wean him from the ventilator. And he was weaned to trach collar and decannulated about a month after he was intubated. So more than four weeks, this gentleman required intubation, required ventilator support. And I mean, he's a relatively young gentleman. I mean, 49 with risk factors, but still relatively young, especially as I get closer and closer to 49. 49 feels very, very young. And so he was ultimately actually discharged to a rehab facility where he's working on regaining his strength. Remember before this, this gentleman was working, he was caring for himself. He was a young guy and now he's actually struggling to learn how to, you know, to really um, keep up his endurance, walk and, and do the sort of things that he used to take for granted. So this can be a tremendously serious infection. All right, let's contrast this with, this with a patient that I saw just about um, a month and a half ago. So this is a 39-year-old woman, a little bit younger than our gentleman. She comes in with a six-month history of shortness of breath with exertion, of fatigue, of daily headaches, palpitations and racing heart rate, and reporting brain fog. And this is really one of the more common things we'll see. 
So her past medical history is significant that she was diagnosed with COVID about six months ago. So um, in February, she developed symptoms, but tested negative. And then her symptoms persisted and she tested again and she was positive at that time. We know that our testing is suboptimal. We need to remember that if somebody has something very consistent with COVID, we should retest them. And, uh, and you don't stop thinking about other things, but it is important to note that the tests are not 100%. She was not admitted to the hospital. She didn't require oxygen. She didn't require any COVID specific therapy. She improved on her own. Previously, she was, you know, she was a little overweight, but really quite healthy. She, um, she has a young son, I think he's nine. And so she played soccer with him. She was active with him. Uh, now she gets short of breath climbing a flight of stairs. She has a history of uh, reactive airway disease and had an albuterol inhaler at home. She'd previously used it really just three or four times a year during the winter months if she had a cold but now she's using it about five times a day. She denies fevers, chills, or night sweats, but she does report being extremely fatigued. Just everything takes tremendous energy and she's exhausted. She doesn't have any chest pain, but she does have palpitations. She's not coughing, but she is short of breath, particularly with mild exertion. And she has some memory loss and brain fog. Her past medical history is significant. She has some hypothyroidism. She has a history of migraines. She has some seasonal allergies and asthma. Um, and she is obese, but, um, but really, otherwise she was pretty functional. Um, she's on Synthroid or Levothyroxine for her hypothyroidism. She has that albuterol inhaler. She's on an antidepressant um, and she's on some things for her, her migraines, an oral contraceptive pill as well. She's married, but separated. Uh, she has a nine-year-old son. She doesn't smoke. She drinks the alcohol very sparingly. She has, a, I'm, I'm an infectious disease physician, so I get to be very nosy and ask about people's pets and travel. And so I know now that she has a pet goldfish. Um, she's employed at a desk job for the U.S. Army, but um, you know, has been working from home since April of 2020. Her family history is significant for uh, COPD in both her mother and maternal grandmother, so a strong history of that in her family, although both of them also smoked. On physical exam, she is afebrile. T -max, or T, her temperature is 37, 98.6, very, very normal. Her weight is a little bit high. She's 83 kilograms with a BMI of about 29. Her heart rate is also high, uh, just like our other gentleman, 112 beats per minute, but her blood pressure is normal, 133 over 87, in fact, a little bit high. Respiratory rate is normal and her oxygen saturation is great. On physical exam, she's not in any distress. She's just tachycardic. And when you listen to her, even though she doesn't complain of a cough, when she takes deep breaths, she does have a dry cough and she has a little bit of chest pain with deep breathing. Her abdomen is non-tender, everything else was normal. We checked her TSH because she does have history of hypothyroidism and that could be related to her fatigue, but it was fine. She had a VQ scan that was negative for a PE, something we were worried about since she's on oral contraception and she had tachycardia, uh, but that was normal. And then she had pulmonary function tests that were all within normal limits. So really nothing objectively that we could see that would really be accounting for this shortness of breath. So what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in, in this woman? Do you think she has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like her mother and her grandmother before her? Do you think she has a pulmonary embolism? Sometimes our CT scans can miss that or our VQ scan can miss that. Do you think she has migraines um, because she is having headaches? Do you think she has depression that her depression has just gotten worse with this chronic illness? Or do you think she has post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection? And I know, again, I'm not trying to trick you. The, the obvious answer is the correct one she really has post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what happens after COVID? I've told you this sort of horror story of what can happen with acute COVID. And now I'm telling you about this person who seemed to not have any of that. She seemed to have a mild course of COVID. She recovered, she was doing better. And now she is sort of, again, couldn't get all the way back to normal and actually is doing a little bit worse. So beginning in early summer of 2020, some patients started reporting prolonged COVID symptoms and they actually really found each other on social media. It's really interesting. This was kind of off our radar. Most physicians were really dealing with acute patients with COVID, trying to keep them alive, trying to protect ourselves, our family, you know, trying to, to work with public health advice. And patients were the ones who really started reporting this saying, you know, they say I'm better, but actually I don't feel much better. And so they kind of found each other on Twitter, on Facebook, on social media. And uh, it was first reported, the first kind of thing that I can really see anybody um, citing is Ed Young's article in The Atlantic in June of 2020 called COVID can last for several months. He interviewed several patients that had reached, you know, that he'd sort of come across on social media and reported what they were reporting. 
He followed that up about a month later with a, um, a an article called Long Haulers Are Redefining COVID-19. And then actually I found this article very useful. This came out in January of 2021 by Felicity Collard and Eliza, Eliza uh, Perego, where they talked really about how long COVID was really really more of a grassroots kind of patient reported symptom or syndrome that, that patients really advocated for, for more research and more um, recognition of what was happening. And so I think, I think this is a good read if you can find it because it was really just a very um, interesting, uh, interesting discussion of how, how this group kind of came together to really advocate for this research. Because of my background in HIV and hepatitis C, we're very familiar with patient advocacy organizations and, and patients really being one of the biggest drivers for research and for acknowledging you know, the areas that still remain for us to, to study. And so I think this has been one of the true success stories of social media in general coming together to, to achieve recognition for this and help drive this research and this, um, this, this study. All right. So again, what happens after COVID? Post-COVID conditions, remember, they sort of started, you know, um, with really advocacy at the patient level. And so everybody started working on this kind of simultaneously. So there wasn't initially a whole lot of consensus about what to even call it what it was. Um, Yed Yong really, really uh, coined that phrase long COVID or long haulers, uh, people who were in it for the long haul. Um, but also people were using post-acute COVID, long-term effects of COVID, the post-acute COVID syndrome, chronic COVID, long-haul COVID. And the research term that really the CDC is, has really advocated for is post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection or PASC. Okay, so I'm gonna use a lot of these ter terms interchangeably. Um, they, they do have differences though, and I wanna talk about that. So the CDC actually specified that anything more than four weeks out from the initial COVID infection itself is technically PASC. So if a patient is diagnosed with COVID on January 1st and they're still having symptoms January 29th, that is PASC. Um, if they have symptoms for more than four weeks, but less than 12 weeks, we're calling that subacute uh, sub or PASC or subacute long COVID. And then anything more than 12 weeks is considered chronic. Um, I actually love the uh, the definitions put together by the national. Uh, these are all out of the UK. The National Institute of Healthcare and Excellence, or NICE, the Royal College of General Practitioners, RCFP, and the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, or SIGN. They established a definition of so-called long COVID that that really um, is very succinct. But it's signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID. And I think that part is important. We know, especially in the beginning, our testing was tremendously inadequate. We just didn't have enough of it. We didn't have the infrastructure to really test as many patients or do broad survey studies to find out where COVID was. Remember up to 80% of people can be completely asymptomatic or have mild symptoms that they might not get tested for. So it's important to, to say that if they had something consistent with COVID, even if they didn't have a definitive COVID diagnosis, and if those symptoms continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternate diagnosis, and that is important. COVID can come along with a couple of other things, particularly clotting disorders that require anticoagulation can give people an increased risk for clots. And that is really a separate concern. So it's important that this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to really kind of dig down into people's history and see if they have something else that could explain this. And it's partly because we don't understand what underlies long COVID. And so we need to really keep our minds open about what we might be assessing patients for. All right. So that's the first part an infection consistent with COVID and not explained by an alternative diagnosis. Okay. So PASC, the scope of the problem, how big is this problem? So to date, there are more than 202 million cases of COVID globally, 35 million cases in the United States. I am sorry to say that that is really that we are the forerunner in the world, um, not something you want to win a gold medal in. And then right now, the last time I checked, there are 31 million cases of COVID-19 in India, and I know that you are all dealing with that. So how many of those patients are at risk for long COVID? Reports vary. You know, this, I, I'm going to say this again and again, but this is a, a period where this the scholarship is very much evolving. You know, a lot of the things that I'm gonna cite are actually preprints, so they have not been critically reviewed. They're just made available early. I will try to highlight it when, when I give you data from a preprint. If something is actually published, I'll try to mention that too. But even in ultimately published, peer-reviewed, approved, you know, published reports, we know that the, the based on the, even the same definition, the 
the prevalence of long COVID can vary widely. So some reports say about 30% of patients, which is still a huge number, but other reports have reported that at least 80% of patients can have one or more symptom at least four weeks out from their COVID diagnosis. So it can really be tremendously prevalent and it, it really matters how we assay for this. So if you take that sort of 80% number, that tells you that of the 200 million people in the world who have, who have presumed or diagnosed COVID-19, 161 million might have long COVID. In the US, up to 28 million might have long COVID. And in India, currently right now, and I know you're still in your sort of second wave, so we don't know where this is gonna go, but right now, 25 million people remain at risk. And that is, a huge number of people and something that our health systems are just not quite yet designed to be able to manage. So, so we're really trying to learn more. All right, so as my, my friend Andrew Levine, who you saw in PPE, full PPE early on kind of says, this is the next public health crisis because there are so many undiagnosed COVID patients out there. We know that the, this 202 million cases globally is an underestimate just because our testing infrastructure is you know, is still struggling to keep up. We know there are a lot of undiagnosed COVID cases out there. So this is really, I, I hate to say this phrase, I know it's overused, but this is really the tip of the iceberg. We, we are gonna be learning a lot more about this and seeing a lot more patients and, in the coming months and years. So what is the COVID-19 time course? You know, I showed you those graphs from China about looking at sort of when people become symptomatic. This is, this is something that was published in Nature Medicine just a couple of months ago. And you can see here that when people sort of are initially exposed, and they develop um, viral shedding in their nasopharyngeal uh, mucosa and in their respiratory tract. You can see that kind of coming up. And then here, this line here is when they develop symptoms and get tested and they're found to, to be PCR positive. The nasopharyngeal PCR kind of stays positive a little bit longer. It seems to be cleared relatively quickly from the respiratory tract. And if you think about the fact that that we're clearing it from the respiratory tract, but this sort of second week here is when people are starting to develop shortness of breath and even respiratory failure. It makes you think that it's really more of a post in, or an inflammatory response to this virus. And that's really what I want you to get from this graph that, that while the virus is persisting in the nasopharyngeal tracts, it does seem to clear from the respiratory tract while people are developing that sort of worsening of symptoms. But then as the, the, the viral load sort of tapers off, as the body clears the virus, this is when we're seeing if these symptoms pop up around after four weeks, this is the PASC, the, the long COVID that we're talking about. And here are some of the symptoms that you should be looking for. Fatigue, declining quality of life, muscular weakness, joint pain, shortness of breath, cough, persistent oxygen requirement, or the perception that patients cannot catch their breath. Remember in our 39 year old woman, her oxygen saturation was fine. She just felt like she couldn't catch her breath. And, and we're gonna delve into that discrepancy a little bit. Um, anxiety or depression, sleep disturbances, PTSD, especially in patients who were particularly ill and, and hospitalized, cognitive disturbances or that brain fog, which is so nonspecific, but many patients do complain of, headaches, palpitations and chest pain, thromboembolism, and this is sort of a separate complication that we'll discuss a little bit more, uh, chronic kidney disease, and hair loss is one of the things that's really popped out of here and I know very concerning to, to almost everybody. All right. So what happens after COVID? Here's sort of broken down by, by muscle system. Patients with PASC can present with prolonged muscle uh, multi-system involvement and significant disability. And this is from a, uh, a recent article that came out in CID. So this is published data. Um, it says in Albadian, but this is, I'm sorry, this is actually from the, I forgot to remove that. This is actually from CID um, in July, looking at uh, patients who were about a year out from COVID, but I just thought it was a good illustration of the, the sy symptoms that we see sort of broken down by organ systems. So here are the neurologic impairments, brain fog, depression, anxiety. Uh, this is a very uh, pretty specific one to COVID-19, the persistent loss of smell and taste and something that really does um, bother patients. Then their cardiovascular complications, particularly chest pain, palpitations, tachycardia, orthostatic hypertension. You can see uh, pulmonary or respiratory complications, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, cough, dyspnea, and hoarseness. Um, exercise intolerance, fatigue, muscle aches, and then vascular complications like swelling and redness. Okay. So long-term effects of COVID. I'm going to point out this is a preprint, but I thought it was a very useful article because it's a meta-analysis of published studies comprising over 47,000 patients, nearly 48,000 patients. This is very early though. So a lot of these symptoms were assessed and reported between two weeks and really three, three and a half months, uh, 13 weeks after the initial COVID diagnosis. And I thought it was a useful illustration 
it does have the list of symptoms, and I know this is hard to read. I have sent the slides, and hopefully um, you can you can get them so you can look at it a little more closely or look up this reference if you're interested. I'm going to try to zoom in and show you the biggest uh, the biggest complaint that patients had post COVID was really this fatigue, with more than 50% of patients complaining of fatigue between two and 13 weeks after their COVID diagnosis, and then headache problems with uh, focus, this can sort of fall into that brain fog basket, hair loss, shortness of breath, uh, agusia or, or inability to taste or altered taste is something we'll hear a lot of patients complain of that everything has kind of a metallic taste, anosmia, not being able to smell, um, joint pain, cough, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, depression, you can see these are sort of falling off. But, but this illustration in general sort of shows you and tries to point to the different places in the body just to sort of aggregate that, that these manifestations can really be all over. But this is the largest survey of these patients and it really reports that 80% of them had at least one symptom. And sometimes those symptoms were associated with abnormalities in imaging or, um, or uh, um, abnormal uh, surrogate biomarkers of inflammation like D-dimer, IL-6, ferritin, CRP, other sort of nonspecific signs of inflammation. But for the most part, it really seems like these symptoms were really kind of what was driving people's complaints. All right. So long-term sequela following COVID. Here's, this is, this is another article that came out in JAMA um, last summer, actually, um, when people were talking about uh, acute uh, COVID. This is one of the first, sort of first surveys. And this was looking at 143 patients who had recovered from COVID. This is two months, about eight weeks after their initial diagnosis. And 84% had one or more persistent symptoms two months later. And you can see here, these are their, on the left side here, are the complaints that they, that they noted, the symptoms that they noted with their initial COVID diagnosis. And a lot of patients initially really just complained of fatigue. Some people had shortness of breath. Some people had joint pain. Some people had cough. Those were sort of the most common things that people had. And you can see those are sort of the most common things that people also continue to report following COVID. They really tend to have this similar presentation to their initial COVID. It's just some of those things get better, but not all the way. So it only ameliorates, it doesn't completely resolve. Um, and that was sort of, the, you know, this is two months after, and then this here is looking four to six months after. So similar kind of assessment, different graphic, but you can see here the patients in sort of yellow to green, this is, these are the symptoms that they had during acute COVID and they were mild or severe, mild or severe fatigue, trouble breathing, loss of smell or taste, cough. These are sort of the main things, muscle aches that people complained of. And you can see those are also the main things that people reported after COVID. They had uh, fatigue, loss of smell or taste, headaches, trouble breathing. Some people had cough and other things became nausea usually you know, seemed to resolve, sweats, ear pain, those things tended to resolve. Okay. All right. The burden of disease is high. The reason I like this graph, and I know this is a lot to take in, it's a huge data, but the point I want to show you is that this really breaks it down by how symptomatic patients were. So one of the big questions is, are people who had more severe COVID more at risk for long COVID, or is it people who had milder COVID? And it is hard to tell. So this is taken from um, a Nature paper that just came out about a month and a half ago in June. It's a high dimensional characterization of this post-acute sequelae. And they broke it down by patients who were positive, so may have had mild or moderate disease, more severe patients who were hospitalized here in orange and then patients who were in the intensive care unit in purple. And you can see that it appears that their symptoms are really more associated with the severity of their initial COVID presentation for pretty much everything. So here you can see this is this over here on the left is really just a zooming in of the of a portion, the bottom portion of this on the right, where you can see that patients who had fatigue, there were there was sort of a slight increase, maybe a hazard ratio of about two. Um, patients who, who had fatigue presentation, this is all normalized to patients who present with influenza. So patients who had uh, COVID were more likely, twice as likely as those who had influenza to, to present with fatigue, but that fatigue appeared to be more and more common in patients who presented to the hospital. This makes sense. And these are their post, post COVID sort of symptoms. Uh, acute kid, kidney injury really kind of crosses one for all patients, but patients who were hospitalized were more likely to have kidney injury following that. The interesting thing here is, so this is a high level, uh, high dimensional characterization. This is a high level look at this. I think it's actually from VA data. Um, but 
this is not universal. So this was from a large study, but when we actually looked, not all studies actually reported this association with this increased severity of disease. So this is again from that paper where they show that the hazard ratio is higher in COVID patients versus all comers to the VA. Um, and you can actually look, patients who died were more likely than other patients, uh, or patients who had COVID were more likely to die than other patients. And patients who were hospitalized, obviously, more likely. Um, but you can really see here that, that when you compare it, it seems like, um, it seems like COVID is um, more prevalent, more morbid than influenza. All right. So does the initial severity of COVID symptoms predict symptom persistence? So this, uh, a different study looking at six month consequences of COVID actually found that patients who require ventilatory support, and that incorporates all kinds of non-invasive ventilation up to intubation and mechanical ventilation. So non-invasive, um, in, uh, in, uh, non-invasive ventilation, so BiPAP, positive pressure, um, ventilation, high flow oxygen, that should say high flow nasal cannula, not MC, and uh, in, intubation and mechanical ventilation. Compared to those who didn't require any supplemental oxygen at all, people who just test, tested positive and had mild symptoms, those patients who had more severe symptoms were more likely to have any symptom six months later, including fatigue and muscle weakness. They were more likely to have more problems with mobility, pain, discomfort, and anxiety and depression. And they had reduced six minute walk tests, reduced walking tolerance six months after their COVID diagnosis. But what's interesting here is that the patients who required supplemental oxygenation, just you know, nasal cannula compared to those who didn't showed actually a reduced odds of symptoms. So it seems like there's sort of a sweet spot. So maybe it's that these patients who required this non-invasive ventilatory support, some of their problems could just be related to their debilitation, to their hospitalization in general. So it's not entirely clear. It would be weird that patients who, who required oxygen, but just mild oxygen, like two liters of, of nasal cannula for a couple of days, compared to those who didn't, would have reduced symptoms, that those who didn't you know, require any supplemental of oxygen at all would be more likely. So hard to kind of suss this out, and it might just be related to, to the severity of their illness. All right. So this was one of the the, art, uh, the forest plots from that um, that six month consequences of COVID nineteen in patients who were discharged from the hospital. I'm going to break it down a little more and show you the question really coming out of this: How do you differentiate symptoms from deconditioning, post ARDS, post ICU sort of uh, problems, you know, dementia and other things that we see in the ICU from PASC? So from that six month factors from COVID, and I know this is hard to see, but I'm going to use this to kind of illustrate a couple of points. So age was associated with a worse diffusion impairment. Age was associated with worsened CT scan findings, but age was not associated with worse, worsened anxiety or depression. You actually see this here. Anxiety, depression, and was even sort of maybe even slightly protected. But we, we did see that age was associated with prolonged symptoms of fatigue and muscle weakness. Patients who were older were more likely to have symptoms six months later of fatigue and muscle weakness. Okay. We also know that women were more likely to have diffusion impairments. So here you can see women were more likely to, to have this impairment noted on an objective testing. There was a trend you can see sort of here, it doesn't, it crosses the line, but women tend to have uh, more changes in their CT, um, sort of worsening of their CT imaging six months later. This was compared to their most, their last CT in the hospital if they had one. Women were more likely to have anxiety or depression. That's something we definitely know from other studies. And women were more likely to have muscle aches or fatigue. But cortico and corticosteroids, which were sort of the mainstay of treatment, especially early on, were also associated, you can see here, associated with an increase in anxiety and depression as and fatigue and muscle weakness. So is this that the corticosteroids caused this or that patients who received corticosteroids were sicker and then were more likely to develop this? And that's something we just don't know yet. All right, so going back to the sort of initial severity predicting symptoms, I pointed out some of the pertinent, you know, significant findings from that last study. But the important, one of the important things is that a lot of the complaints people, people come to me and tell me about, sleep difficulties, hair loss, smelling problems, palpitations, joint pain, appetite, especially decreased appetite because they can't taste things, dizziness, diarrhea, vomiting, chest pain, rash, myalgias, activity intolerance, pain or discomfort, quality of life. They were not different between the two groups of people who had mild or severe, people who had modest oxygen requirements and people who required invasive ventilation. They were not different. Most uh, pulmonary function test parameters did not differ based on severity of illness. 
and most CT scan, scan findings did also not not differ based on disease severity. So it does seem, and we have seen this anecdotally, and I know the plural of anecdote is not data, but we have seen this anecdotally where a lot of patients, like my 39-year-old woman, she was not severely ill to begin with. She did not require oxygen. She did not require hospitalization. She was able to kind of ride this out at home with Tylenol and some extra sleep, but she is now having these symptoms later on. So we've sort of seen that, that that people who are hospitalized might have more prolonged prob problems with their hospitalization, but people who were not hospitalized were not that severely ill do seem to be at risk for long COVID. All right, so here's another uh, publication. This is by Townsend in Annals of, uh, of uh, the, Thoracic uh, the Association for Thoracic Surgery, published in 2021. This really showed, again, that, that persistent symptoms seem to be unrelated to severity of illness. So when they looked at people who were not admitted compared to those who were admitted but not in the intensive care unit and admitted it to the intensive care unit, while those people who were admitted to the intensive care unit trended towards having a more abnormal chest x-ray, there did not to be a, seem to be a difference in their, their six-minute walk test, or the maximal Borg is actually their perception of their shortness of breath, so how short of breath they felt, regardless of how far they were able to walk. There was really no association. You do see actually a little bit of uh, an association with age. So patients who are older seemed more likely to have decreased six-minute walk testing. Um, even when you compare patients of the same age in the three sort of different categories of not being admitted, admitted, but not to the ICU or to the ICU. So you saw a, a component of age. You also saw that women in general seem to have particularly um, decreased six minute walk and decreased perception of their ability to walk. And then CFS is actually the critical frailty score. So we know that patients who are frailer seem to be hit harder with, with their COVID recovery. They had decreased the most um, sort of significant decreased six minute walk and, um, and also a sort of a, a borderline perception of their ability to walk. All right, so persistent symptoms unrelated to severity of illness, but related to age, sex, and frailty. It's the takeaway. So how long do symptoms last? What can we tell our patients about how long these symptoms will persist? I think the, I think the best thing we can say to patients in general is tell them when we don't know. And we try to do that. We try to say, we are learning. I have no idea. I cannot, or not, I don't have no, I don't, not I have no idea, but I am, I can't tell you definitively. I can tell you a little bit about what we know. So we do know that the probability of having, um, having symptoms does seem to fall off over time. So this was a study that monitored patients who had long COVID or PASD seven months for seven, followed them longitudinally seven months after their initial diagnosis. And they did find that over that that time, there was a small and slow decrease in the number of symptoms that people reported. There was also an interesting change in the symptom severity score over time. So patients who had very severe or severe symptoms, their symptoms seem to improve. So again, this sort of supports that patients who initially have severe COVID seem to actually do better in the long term and get better. Now, maybe that's just compared to the severity of their COVID and they're like, well, everything's relative and I don't feel quite as bad as I did. But those patients who had very mild or mild COVID in the beginning seem to then have an increase of their symptoms and then maybe that levels off or improves over the next four to six months. So it's hard to say, but it does seem like patients who did better in the sort of initial presentation and were not as sick might actually have more symptoms and maybe it's just their expectations are better. Are, are worse, you know, that, that patients who are severely ill are like, well, I'm gonna, it's gonna be a slow recovery, but I'm gonna fight my way back. Whereas patients who were not that sick initially are then sort of surprised to have these symptoms and they, they don't, you know, surprised when they don't get better right away. We also do know that the average number of symptoms over time seems to improve. Now this is sort of artificial. This is patients who recovered within three months. So patients who reported no symptoms at three months, obviously you're sort of enriching for those patients. So they, if you, if you pick the people who you know are going to cover and you then track their recovery, they recover. But, but you can really see the patients who continue to report symptoms had a, maybe sort of an initial increase of symptoms over those first two months right after their COVID and then seem to slowly decrease over time. So this is what we try to tell all of our patients. You know, if you had more symptoms after COVID, then we, you know, we are going to evaluate you thoroughly. We're going to try to figure out what's going on. We're going to make sure that there's nothing else contributing that we can treat. But I would expect that this will be a slow 
improvement over time. And it's really going to be a marathon and not a sprint. You know, we're going to be working with you, trying to get you back to where you were. All right. What are the mechanisms? Why is this happening to people? I would love to be able to tell you that. And we just don't know yet. So the study that I'm doing, we're trying to, we're trying to look by we're doing um, very sensitive MRI imaging in recovered patients. We're doing soluble biomarkers of inflammation. And then we're also doing very specific um, functional testing, including uh, you know, activities of daily living, six minute walk tests, other things like that to try to determine exactly what is driving the symptoms of long COVID. But these are some of the mechanisms that people have proposed. So is this a persistent viral reservoir? We know COVID is an RNA infection, and so it shouldn't have a long-term reservoir, but you know, is there some chronically infected system in some compartment that we can't assay that, that is driving this ongoing inflammation? We're looking. Um, is it clotting related damage to multiple organ systems? This is something we know with COVID, it does cause clotting and an increased coagulability in our patients. Many of our patients who've developed DVT, then they need to be anticoagulated. So you would expect that the anticoagulation might ameliorate some of these symptoms if that's the case, but people are looking at that now. Is this ongoing inflammation driven by viral frag fragments as the immune system breaks down the virus, this RNA virus, do these small pieces of RNA then continue to drive inflammation? that we don't know. Is this autoimmune or some sort of immune dysregulated response into the virus? And this is supported by some of the things we've seen with COVID, the myocarditis, some of the neuroinvasive or neurotrophic inflammation, particularly related to the anosmia or dyskusia that we're seeing in patients. Is it disrupted neuroendocrine signaling? That perhaps is more consistent with what we're seeing with patients who report that they feel short of breath, even if we can't measure that they are hypoxic with exertion. So is it really some sort of uh, disrupted signaling in their perception of their abilities. And that, that is something we're looking into. Is it alterations? This is sort of the, mo the most interesting one I've kind of seen recently, alterations in the host microbiome or virome. Anybody who works in the microbiome will tell you that, that the microbiome can pretty much be blamed for everything. And so I've seen a couple publications of people looking to see if the microbiome or the virome changes after COVID. But with such a severe infection, it, it, you know, it seems like everything might change. And so we're looking at that to see if it really changes in ways that might be consistent with ongoing inflammation or ongoing problems. So I think the first thing that you wanna do with every patient who comes in with complaints of long COVID is don't just put your COVID blinders on. Don't just say, oh, this is long COVID and here's what I'm gonna tell you. You really need to think about the differential diagnosis. Is there something going on? You know, This woman is six months out from COVID, so we should really think about anything else that could be going on. You know, She's got hypothyroidism, so that's why we checked her TSH. She has a history of migraines. Is there something that is, you know, caused her to lose control of her migraines? Has she changed her habits? Is she you know, drinking less coffee? Is there something else driving that? So, you know, really going through the, the, the differential diagnosis for each patient. And so that includes a workup for anxiety, depression, PTSD, or a stroke, these coagulable complications of COVID that we do know to find. Um, we can look for myocarditis because that would drive our treatment. You can look for cardiac ischemia if your patient has risk factors. You can look for the POTS post, um, you know, postural uh, orthostat orthostasis uh, syndrome that relates to how people's blood pressure uh, is misregulated or dysregulated when they change position. You can look to see if they have a viral pneumonia, at least you know, that kind of would give them some other sort of um, thing to, to, you know, to, to diagnose and then you know, sort of associate with a prognosis. So some sort of prognosis about when you can expect it to improve. Do they have a secondary infection? Like my first gentleman who had a ventilator associated pneumonia that required separate antibiotic therapy. Do they have pulmonary fibrosis? Do they have a pulmonary embolism? There are very specific treatments for those. Did they suffer any kind of damage with their COVID and have a paralyzed diaphragm? Um, in patients who've been hospitalized, obviously we always wanna look for deconditioning because we know that patients will need therapy and, and rehabilitation. Do they just have fatigue? You know, is there, are they getting poor sleep? That's something you can, you can then do something about. And then uh, obviously, do they have a DVT because that also would require anticoagulation. So symptom-based approach to diagnosis, these are some of the things that we do for our patients. So the MOCA is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. HADS or HADS is the Hospital Anxiety and Depression uh, Score, uh, uh, just a survey you can do with patients to see if they need an antidepressant or some sort of intervention for depression and anxiety. The PCL5, which uh, I had to write down what it is because I don't ever remember, and I'm sorry, uh, the PCA uh, is an assessment for PTSD. 
can do neurocognitive testing, you can do a psychological evaluation. And like we're doing for our patients, we can do an MRI, but I can tell you that it is not the vast majority of patients who have abnormal or typical finding to any kind of typical MRI finding that we have been able to associate with, associate with COVID. For their cardiac evaluation, you're doing an EKG, you're doing an orthostatic blood pressure, checking troponins to make sure they haven't had a myocardial infarction. You're checking for, for congestive heart failure, you might do an echo. Um, we don't do this on every single patient, but these are the things you'd be thinking of. If you're going to do a pulse ox, you're going to do a six minute walk test. You might do full PFTs or a CT scan or a chest X-ray on your patients. Again, six minute walk test to assess their, their musculoskeletal function. You might prescribe rehab or physical therapy, occupational therapy to help them kind of get back from where they, where they were back to where they were. And then you might look at a vascular duplex to diagnose them with a DVT or CTA to look for a pulmonary embolism. But I, I am sorry to tell you, there are no currently approved, validated, you know, proven, there are no therapeutic options at present. There are a lot of things we're looking at. So what do we do for our patients? And this is really um, what, we try, what we try to do. So we, we have patients come in and we try to do a comprehensive assessment. We try to look and really figure out what their most worrisome and concerning symptoms are and really try to address that in sort of a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary way. So multidisciplinary uh, care in a post-COVID clinic and preferably with a provider who is familiar with that disease process and can kind of let them know what to expect. Uh, we try to practice evidence-based clinical medicine always, right? We try to really follow this literature, figure out what is new and figure out what is going on with our individual patient. We try to do no harm. And I think that is something we have all seen during this pandemic. There are many reports of, you know, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. People have tried everything. And is it, it is important to find that initial report and see what people are saying, but then follow up that literature. Because with hydroxychloroquine, we, we saw patients who had cardiac abnormalities. We saw patients who had toxicity. And it can be, it can be very hard to do nothing for a patient when they want something. But if you know that, you know that that data has not supported that intervention, it is important to not expose your patient to harm. So we continue to try to reassess each of these proposed interventions to really make sure that we're offering our patient something that has some sort of um, mechanism and some sort of data supporting it. We try to validate our patients' fears and concerns. We try to tell them, You're, this is not all in your head. This is something that we are seeing and we are gonna continue to work with you to try to make it better. And I can't say this enough, we don't know yet exactly what's going on with long COVID. So if, if you have any clinical trials available to you, if anybody is doing cohort data, that is how we will learn more about this disease by doing careful clinical research to try to understand what, what this is. You know, we know long COVID is a syndrome with all of that Im implies that it is a basket of collective symptoms that many of our patients seem to have. And some of them will have something that we will, you know, be able to figure out. And some of them will just kind of fall into that basket because it's consistent. So we're really trying to learn what these symptoms are, what really is caused by COVID, what is caused by other things, what, what we can do something about. All right, clinic models. This is something that came out of Yale, the recovery clinic or comprehensive post-COVID center at Yale, where they're looking at sort of their um, every stage of a patient's presentation. So when they have inpatients who have been admitted for COVID pre-discharge, pre they're trying to do a full respiratory assessment, a functional assessment and care coordination. And then really kind of wrapping all that up into then their initial follow-up appointment, usually by telehealth, where they kind of check in with all the symptoms that they had during their hospitalization, repeat some of, the, some of those diagnostics and assessments to kind of see where their patients are doing where their patients are and how they're doing, and then continue to sort of reassess and refer. So if patients are continuing to report shortness of breath, they refer them for pulmonary care. If they're continuing to report sort of being debilitated, then reporting, uh, referring them for physical therapy and occupational therapy and continuing to sort of follow each of these. And then subsequent visits just to kind of continue to, to sort of check in, see how they're doing. And if anything new comes up, if they require new imaging, if they require new assessments, new anticoagulation, whatever. But it's all in sort of a multidisciplinary way. 
This is another uh, model, this is out of the Brigham, where they have sort of inpatient assessments and then they try to coordinate when patients are discharged with sort of home care, follow up with subspecialty assessments. All those assessments come together to our sort of quarterback, our primary care provider who can hopefully take all this information and talking with the patient sort of figure out where to go from there. This is sort of the most common, um, I would say this is the most common, you know, sort of clinic model for all care when we don't really know what's happening when somebody is discharged from the hospital. You try to get all the information from both the hospitalization, from any subspecialty assessments, and really kind of coordinate that into a plan that makes sense for the patient. It looks more complicated than it is. It's really just about, you know, synthesizing a broad range of information and trying to then come up with a plan, formulating a plan that your patient can, can work with and then and sort of visiting back and seeing how you're doing in sort of an iterative process. All right. So these are some of the models we have. You know, this can get complicated though. So if you're talking about your patient and then all these subspecialty, you know, sort of consultants or other people who are who are giving your um, their opinions about your patient, you know, sleep medicine, nephrology, pulmonology, cardiology, somebody like me from infectious disease, you're kind of taking all these these special subspecialties and trying to, to get everybody's perspective on the patient. You're trying to take all these different roles, you know, patients from the, the medicine team, the physical therapist, the speech therapist, the pharmacist who might be prescribing some of these medications and making sure that they're working or being used appropriately, rehabilitation, occupational therapy, nutrition, social work, all these people sort of working together. And so that creates a huge community of people that you're trying to talk to for each patient. And it, it really is a logistical problem, particularly in a time and place when it's hard for us to all meet in one room. And when you're talking about, you know, millions of people sort of requiring this care, this is obviously logistically prohibitive, as they say. And so it's really, I think, stresses the importance of communication and the importance in thinking about the ways that our patients tell us about symptoms and the ways that we try to set expectations for our patients. All right, so ongoing problems for PASC, obviously infrastructure problems. We don't have enough providers to see this many patients, nor do we exactly know what we're treating. So we don't know exactly how to, how to really to, to accommodate this. We don't have enough clinic space. We don't have enough appointments. I have to say, I think a lot of people write off PASC as very similar to, you know, sort of a hysteria or, you know, uh, uh, equated to other things that we don't really know what's going on uh, that can be easily dismissed by medicine, like fibromyalgia or other things. People are maybe not as interested. They're like, well, we know you're getting better. Just hang in there and, and you know, it's going to take time. And that's not always as useful. Logistical problems. Who should see these patients? We don't know if this is related to the infection. We don't know if this is related to debilitation. We don't know if this is related to autoimmune disease or neuroendocrine problems. We don't know if this is related to to um, you know, post, comp post infectious complications of steroids. These are all things that we need to really figure out in order to figure out how to best treat these patients. How do we identify patients who are most likely to benefit from long-term care? How should patients be triaged? Knowledge problems, who will have PSC? We know that people who are older are at risk. We know that women are at risk, but we don't know how else to, those are not modifiable risk factors. I can't make you younger. I can't, you know, I can't change you into somebody who will have less risk. So how do we follow them? There is no known treatment at this point. So good clinical practice will really come through large randomized clinical trials, large cohort studies. Access is a challenge. And a lot of patients don't necessarily want to be studied. So it's something we have to talk to them about, about the fact that we won't know until we do these studies. There is a pathway forward. I think a systematic approach to following up post-COVID illness, so either a telephone-based or virtual screening, especially in the beginning when they're sort of getting back home and on their feet, an initial vis visit virtually or face-to-face -face with their primary care provider to talk about what their needs are and what their concerns are, what their symptoms are, a systematic assessment of patient needs, referrals if necessary, then providing the support and infrastructure for multidisciplinary clinics, trying to get everybody on the same page in some sort of post-COVID clinic model would be useful. Um, and then you can put patients together for support groups and, and physical therapy and other things. Reward and incentivize trainees to do primary care. Try to, you know, patient, people go into medicine, doctors go into medicine because they wanna help people. And so if they see there is a need there and there, is, uh, there are resources there, then they will be interested. More research funding for deeper phenotyping of this disease process and for interventional trials. The NIH is reporting this through their recover initiative. And then there are others that are trying to support research in this area as well. Current drug trials. So people are looking at antifibrotic therapy. People are looking at nintadanib, which was stopped for adverse events, naltrexone and NAD, 
niacin, vitamin therapy, monolucast, anticoagulation for uh, VTE associated with COVID. That is not investigational. We do know that that helps. There was actually a recent study in New England Journal that showed that um, patients who have, um, pa patients who are who are moderately, mild to moderately affected with COVID do benefit from, um, from anticoagulation. And then if somebody has an, uh, an embolism, if somebody has some kind of clot or deep venous thrombosis, they do require anticoagulation. There's this question, and I wanna talk about this just in the last couple of minutes about COVID-19 vaccine itself being a treatment for PASC. And I think that's one of the more interesting things that we've seen recently evolve in real time. So in early spring 2020, there were circulating reports on social media that suggested that patients who had long COVID or PASC were improving after they got COVID vaccination. So this idea um, that it was actually published in the New York Times on March uh, 17th under the, the um, headline there, you can see on the lower left, some long COVID patients feel much better after getting the vaccine. And within that article, they actually quoted this patient, Akiko, it was uh, this patient, this, this doctor, excuse me, this researcher, Akiko uh, Iwasaki, she's a researcher at Yale. And she, uh, Eric Topol, um, who I think is at Penn, but I'm not sure, and others have actually started a clinical trial of vaccination for long COVID patients. She cited, and I cannot find where this was, but she said in her interview, that their preliminary data showed that about 30 to 40% of patients reported improvement, which is huge for something that we really don't know very much about, uh, for, for a, a disease, a syndrome that we don't know as much about. So, um, so they are continuing to enroll patients and hopefully we'll get results later this year. But I think the really the most important thing I can tell you is that preventing COVID is really the best treatment or best prevention for long COVID. So the best way to prevent long-term complications of COVID is to prevent people getting COVID to begin with. So currently more than 90% of COVID cases are obviously occurring in unvaccinated persons. Breakthrough infections do occur, but they are less severe and less fatal. And that is definitely something as a physician, I like less severe, I like less fatal. So in one study, this is, um, this is from uh, the New England Journal just gosh, about a week and a half ago, a week ago. Um, this is Israeli healthcare workers who had uh, who were vaccinated, 1,497 vaccinated Israeli healthcare workers, and they were reporting break breakthrough infections in vaccinated healthcare workers. But I thought this nugget was most interesting, that of these 1,500 vaccinated healthcare workers, there were only 39, 39, 2.6% had breakthrough infections. So first of all, we know vaccinations work. They decrease breakthrough infections. And then one, if people do develop breakthrough infections, they are, you know, less likely to be hospitalized, less likely to die. So vaccine vaccination works, but above and beyond that 19% of those 40 patients. So about maybe eight of them had, um, had persistent symptoms for more than six weeks, 20%. Remember, I told you that the, the variability of, of, prevalence of long COVID really varies a lot, but it seems to be somewhere between 30 and 80%, sorry. But it does seem like it is less prevalent, long complications, longer symptoms of COVID seem to be less prevalent if you are vaccinated. So here it was just 20% of those people who had breakthrough infections, so overall reduced. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we will see more reports about what these prolonged symptoms look like. This was still early. This was just six weeks after their COVID infection. So I'm really looking forward to the follow-up data on what happens four months, six months, one year later on these patients. So in summary, it is common up to 80% of patients might have persistent symptoms. It is common for symptoms to persist after SARS-CoV-2 infection. If symptoms persist for more than four weeks after COVID infection, that is called post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I can tell you, patients find it tremendously reassuring to have a name for their illness. There is no specific therapy for PASC, and it is important to tell people that, that we are still learning. But make sure that you evaluate for other common complications or mimics. So particularly important to assess for clotting problems. Did patients develop a DVT, a PE, or have a stroke? Consider enrolling your patients in a study or observational cohort. The more data we have, the more likely we are to find an answer and help our patients. Prevention is best. Get vaccinated as soon as you are able and encourage others to do as well. You know, I think scientific communication has really come a long way. We are all learning to talk to people who are hesitant to get to vaccines, sometimes with varying success, but it's important that we keep trying. And as more and more people see people vaccinated and see those patients do better, I am hopeful that they will become more willing to be vaccinated as well.
All right. I want to just finish with one last thing. I want you to, rem to remind you there's more to life than COVID. You know, it is easy in the midst of this epidemic to attribute everything to COVID, but we can still miss things. And this is one of the biggest problems as our hospital fills up with COVID patients. You can miss other things or patients can die from things that wouldn't normally kill them because we are all turning our attention to COVID. So preventing COVID is important, not only to help prevent long-term complications of COVID, people dying of COVID, but also prevent people from dying of other things that are not COVID. I, I have a, a sad story to tell you that we had a patient who presented three times to our emergency department and he was tested for COVID each time. And it wasn't until the last time when somebody took a very careful history and realized that this patient had acute HIV and it was missed because we were so focused on preventing COVID or, or attributing everything to COVID. So luckily he was, he was diagnosed, he started on medications and he's doing quite well, but it, it is important to remember that while it seems like COVID is all around us, not everything is COVID and there are many other things that we can assess for and treat. So thank you so much for, for, for paying attention to my talk. Obviously, uh, this is something we're all familiar with, tips for staying safe during COVID or the next uh, emerging infection. So personal hygiene, washing your hands, co covering your cough, uh, avoiding sick contact, staying home when you're sick, seeking medical assistance. You know, we need to, to continue to think about advising everybody to mask and, and, um, and you know, be careful out there. Diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics are all part of this. Thank you so much for your attention. I'd like to thank Megan Deming and Andrea Levine in particular for their, their slides and, um, and input on this. The Institute of Human Virology and Dr. Gallo and Dr. Kodalil for, for, for my job and for being wonderful, amazing bosses. And then our COVID-19 providers, patients, researchers, first responders, and data fanatics. So many people really stepped up to put this information out there, especially when we didn't know anything. I, there was somebody I follow on Twitter who was making a graph every day. It wasn't part of his job. It was just useful information that he could share. And so I really appreciate all those people for helping us. And that's all I had to share. So any questions? What can I tell you? What did I not say or say that was confusing? Please, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Eleanor. It was a wonderful talk. You have answered a lot of questions. At the same time, you have raised a lot of questions also. <laughs> and, Sorry. <laughs> and these questions, definitely, all of us will have to find solutions. Uh, we need research. And uh, we have got uh, uh, some presentations from our side, Kerala State. Will you please uh, remain with us so that they will also be presenting? And then after that, we can take the questions combined. Is it OK? Yes, absolutely. Oh, perfect. Now, the, the next session will be uh, moderated by Professor Thomas Hyde, who is a professor of neurology and a well-known researcher. He is from Government Medical College, uh, Trivandrum. Uh, Dr. Thomas Hyde, please take over. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, um, Rajmohan sir, um, Shaji sir, um, and um, Elnor, uh, let me, uh, without wasting time, I think we'll go, go on to our, our experience from Kerala. First, let me invite Dr. Chantini, Professor of Medicine, Government Medical College, Kori Code, to present the emergencies that uh, she has encountered with post-COVID. Over to you, Dr. Chantini. Thank you. Uh, uh... I think I'm audible. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mohan, sir. And thank you, Rajmohan, sir. Thank you, Thomas Saib, sir. And uh, Dr. Elena has made my job much, much, much simpler. And uh, I start with the place where she stopped. There is more to life than COVID. It's a very interesting quote. I think we need to think on that aspect also. So I'll be just briefly taking through post-COVID emergencies that we should be thinking of that we should not be missing, as she has rightly pointed out, but she, they have just uh, given a case story that how we how we have to think about. So I'll be just very briefly rushing through the post-COVID emergencies, the presentations, management challenges, and long-term security. So I don't have to take you through because this has already been covered. How are the pathophysiological mechanisms with regard to extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID-19? And we know that most important one is actually the 
uh, uh, cytokine release and the immune dysregulation as we always speak about it. And we always wonder why some people develop severe disease, why some people develop post-COVID, why some people develop complication due to post-COVID. So that all might answer by the dysregulated and excessive cytokine release, lymphopenia, increased brain activity, IL-1 and IL-6, all these things happen differently in different people. And uh, there are many pathophysiological mechanisms to address why there is acute myocardial injury that is happening. It could be type 1 myocardial infarction, type 2 viral myocarditis, and Takashubo, and all those things plus cardiomyopathy. And neurological complications are also uh, the, it could come as encephalitis, acute disability, encephalomyelitis, or ADAM, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, very common. And venous sinus thrombosis, endotheliolitis, dysfunction of smell and taste, and GBS and variants. And I'm sure uh, we might have seen one or two cases of this sort. And uh, obviously, stroke and myocardial infarction initially presents to the uh, uh, ED, emergency department itself. And Elena has, has already given us that what it is. It is more than four weeks. Acute COVID usually lasts up to four weeks. And beyond that, we put it as post COVID. And uh, she has already elaborated on the lingering COVID-19 symptoms. So I'll be taking through where we get patients to the emergency department following COVID, uh, recovering from COVID. It could be due to myocardial infarction. It could be stroke. It could be due to pulmonary embolism. Patients might come with deep venous thrombosis of blood or pelvic veins or spanconic circulations or cerebral venous thrombosis. All these things are happening to then they come to the casualty or emergency department and we need to be ready, ready to receive those cases so that we will not miss those things. And uh, this point, I think we have already another session on the pulmonary function, but pulmonary embolism, consider pulmonary embolism in a case of marked increase or rising D-dimer from the baseline value, acute worsening of oxygenation, blood pressure, tachycardia with imaging findings not consistent with worsening of COVID-19 pneumonia. And why there is uh, so much of venous thromboembolism, and these are the related risk factors that lead to venous thromboembolism, while first and foremost is ICU admission and cytokine storm, lung injury, cancer, obesity, male age, comorbidities that usually happens in a patient from female from Kerala. All these things actually put together them at higher risk for COVID-19 venous thromboembolism. And uh, there are many clinical presentations in ED. I'll just briefly go through because I don't have time to discuss each case. Vascular events are very common, myocardial infarction, stroke, pulmonary embolism also very common. These are also usually described, but we see cases of gangrene, acute lymph ischemia, and loss of, uh, uh, loss of the, uh, even in people who have received anticoagulation, this sort of presentation in the post-COVID situation has been the and we see unilateral lymphedema, which suggests uh, DVT, and we must be ready for an, another outbreak, out, uh, another episode of acute breathlessness. The patient might come next with that acute uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. Pneumothorax and mediastinal emphysema is very, very common. Myo and myopericarditis and multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and adults. And uh, GBS uh, is not that common, but we see more cases with related to, it's not more, but comparatively more number in uh, post-vaccine. And hyperglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis presentations are there, and COVID-associated infections are also there. So this is a 47-year-old male. He was recovered from COVID infection, pneumonia. He went back home, and later he comes with worsening of dyspnea, and it was interesting to see uh, this is the subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum, and we can see that uh, the uh, the pector, pectoralis muscle that shows the striations, and it's a classical sign described as dingo leaf signs, and there is uh, pneumomediastinum, and, and then there is uh, air in the muscle plates. So this means we know much little, but we have to see more towards it, and we must be expecting it because this happened in young and asymptomatic too. And there are a lot of diagnostic dilemmas, especially with vaccination. We may get positive antibodies even in people who are vaccinated. And this may be unrelated. Patient may be having antibody positive, but the whole symptom might be unrelated to post-COVID. 
So we need to rule out all the mimickers, especially when patient comes with the conjunctival congestion and all those symptoms with fever. In our place, we have to rule out leptospirosis, dengue, scrub, malaria, and all sorts of things we have to think and and stroke and myocardial infarction, even otherwise we see. So comorbidities also there in, and the long-term course, we have to wait and see what is going to happen in these patients. I don't think I have to go for the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. The patient comes with fever and elevated um, inflammatory markers. And uh, there is either uh, conjunctivitis, rash, hypotension, shock with features of myocardial dysfunction and there is evidence of coagulopathy and most of the patients will have diarrhea, vomiting and abdominal pain. So this happens in pediatric emergency department with elevated markers of inflammation and we need to rule out other obvious microbial cause of inflammation before putting it as a multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and evidence of COVID-19 either by RT-PCR or by rapid antigen test or by the serology or if anything, nothing is available, maybe even a likely contact with patients with COVID-19 in the family will help us. So these are I, from our own pediatric uh, colleagues we, I collected. So there is subconjunctive hemorrhage, conjunctival congestion, typical rash. All these patients with fever and hypotension presenting with abdominal pain, we need to think of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. And multisystem inflammatory syndrome in an adult is also not that uncommon. Aged more than 21 years, hospitalized with fever, there is no alternative diagnosis for the illness. We need to suspect this and we have, we may get the rash, but patients usually come with abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, hypotension and fever with raised markers. Along with severe cardiac illness, rash or non purulent conjunctivitis and secondary clinical criteria, new onset neurological signs, shock, hypotension, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea and thrombocytopenia. So we need to have a pri one primary clinical criteria and secondary clinical criteria. One primary clinical criteria must be there along with laboratory evidence and a positive SARS-CoV-2 test during the current illness, either by artificial serology or antigen detection. Usually we get a, uh, a serology test, but it might be difficult if there is a patient has got already vaccinated. We need to be careful about that aspect too. And COVID-associated mucomycosis, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis, and there are new entities to remember, and even secondary bacterial infections. All these are more common in patients, and maybe we will be uh, looking for COVID antibody so that it might give us a clue, a recent COVID infection, and it might be due to post-COVID. So this sort of presentation, it is due to COVID-associated mucomycosis, so we need to be careful when these patients come to us, because if we don't intervene promptly, they might... Uh, uh, lose the vision or they might lose their life with the disfigurement and all sorts of things can happen for the patient. So when we discharge a patient from post hospital from, with COVID-19, we need to tell them if there is any progressive or new respiratory symptoms prior to their intended review date. They need to report. Unexplained tiredness could be something like a myocardial infarction or ischemia, focal neurological deficit or any alarming symptoms we need we need to tell them that you need to report and don't wait for the uh, intended visit. And patients at highest risk of COVID-19 pneumonia complications are actually having this sort of complications of new, uh, pulmonary embolism and other things. So we need to address them, like managed on ICUs, HDUs, discharge with a new oxygen prescription, protracted dependency on high FiO2, NIV. All these patients are likely to come with, uh, may have a very uh, nearly... They, they may come a visit to the emergency department. So we have to be more careful in those patients. And one point I would like to stress because we are more preoccupied with the symptoms and signs and we uh, of late, so once in a while we are hearing a patient committing suicide. So we don't know what are the psychosocial impacts with COVID-19, but uh, maybe we have to wait longer to see what it is and what to understand it better. So I've been trying to take you through some of the important aspects that we should be looking, especially with cardiovascular, neurological, stroke in the form of venous infarcts or arterial infarcts, acute lymph ischemia, deep venous, deep vein thrombosis, as well as situations like COVID-associated mucomycosis, COVID-associated pulmonary aspergillosis. And we need to ensure that our patients also understand these signs and symptoms and they report to the emergency department timely and appropriately.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Chandini, for giving your uh, practical experience and your suggestions for our patients um, and also for sticking to time. Um, uh, I think we will take the questions at the end. We will uh, request Dr. Sanjeev Nair, uh, Associate Professor of Pulmonology at Government Medical College, Trishur, to, uh, to share his experience with the respiratory complications, uh, the pulmonary manifestations of the long COVID, the Kerala scenario. Over to you. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Is the slide visible also, sir? Yes, yes. It's all clear. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me start by thanking our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mohan, sir. Uh, Dr. Rajmohan and Dr. Thomas Sai for this opportunity to interact with you. Uh, the time given to me is short, so I'll rush through. Some of the points that I'm going to talk on have already been covered by Dr. Eleanor Wilson. Uh, I'll just be brief, I'll just be briefly touching on some of those aspects and I'll move on more towards the management strategies and all in the Kerala scenario. So what we have uh, for the uh, plan for discussion is just briefly touch on what are the pulmonary manifestations in terms of India and Kerala scenario. We don't really have much of data. So it's more of experience sharing. Uh, uh, also a bit on the therapeutic options and how it applies to our scenario for some of the public health issues and strategies that will come up. And a final slide on what uh, our university could do with respect to this. So most of these things have been covered in detail by Dr. Eleanor. So uh, the point is that uh, you have many uh, symptoms which remain in patients, but the respiratory symptoms are quite common. Whichever the study you take, whichever the setting you take, ranging from somewhere around 6% to around 33%. So the numbers are not very clear. We really don't know what proportion of them have it. From the Indian scenario, what we had is the cases, the peaking started early in uh, Delhi and in Mumbai. So what we had is that the experience from Mumbai particularly and Delhi was the one that was shared with us. At that time, Kerala did not have so many cases and we were, we were not really having the seculae of uh, you know, all these patients post-COVID. So we really were not just watching to see what would happen. Whereas from Mumbai and Delhi, a lot of reports were coming and you know, we, we got all our ideas from there initially and we sort of became biased also because of that. And uh, you know, Dr. Eleanor was speaking very positively about media and social media. In India, it, it is a tricky thing, you know, the media can take it either way. And with respect to COVID, what really happened is with the Mumbai experience, the media came out in a big way saying that, you know, the post-COVID lung fibrosis is India's next health crisis. You have a tsunami of uh, post-COVID lung fibrosis that is going to come in India, that hospital beds are getting filled up with post-COVID lung fibrosis, all because of some articles that came in. This was a review article by Dr. Zari Rudwadi, I'll be showing one of his uh, CT pictures later. So basically based on some experience from Mumbai and uh, maybe a little bit from Delhi, uh, there was a bit of scare that we are going to have a huge number of uh, post-COVID, uh, particularly lung fibrosis coming to our clinics and the hospital beds are going to be filled up. Right. We really don't know what are the numbers. I mean, we really need to work out. Dr. Eleanor gave us a multiplication factor and that would make it very frightening. You know? I mean, if that happens, we really would struggle. But the tsunami that was to come did not really come to Kerala with respect to lung fibrosis. That is something that I can tell you right now. So what you have is you have patients coming with breathlessness, which in all the studies that Dr. Eleanor also mentioned, and from our side also, the commonest respiratory symptom with which patients come. So the symptoms are more or less similar to, you know, in many patients to what you would get in a patient with asthma, more or less a reactive airway disease kind of symptom. Some of them are, you know, uh, the symptoms that come with the typical post-viral uh, respiratory symptoms that come in our patients, which would come with the, our flu, which would come with all the viral fevers that we commonly have in Kerala, kind of bronchiolitis kind of picture. Some of them come with organizing pneumonia when we take a CT. We don't really take a CT for all of them, so we really don't know. And and, uh, Dr. Chani was already mentioning on the thromboembolic uh, pulmonary episodes that would come. Cough is the next common symptom. And again, the cough is uh, more like a wheezy kind of cough, which commonly would come in a similar scenario with asthma, a bit with bronchiolitis also, uh, and some with secondary infections. Secondary infections are not that common to the extent that we expect, but some of them do have secondary infection. Surprise, to my surprise, at least one of the common uh, symptoms or uh, you know disease state that we had in uh, at least in Trishur where I work right now is pneumothorax if you I mean uh, 
from the newspaper reports that I showed you earlier, one would expect that my ward would be filled up with patients with post-COVID lung fibrosis. But what you have is if you come to the ward in Trishur today, you would see that uh, half the patients there are uh, pneumothorax, either during a COVID or following a COVID. So some kind of cystic uh, you know, insult in the lung, which uh, with the cough and the violent cough that occurs must be causing pneumothorax. Some of them, even without pneumothorax, end up with the mediastinal uh, emphysema and surgical emphysema, which is visible. Of course, the lung fibrosis is there. I'm not saying that it's not there, but it's not to that. Uh, you know, it's not as common as what we anticipated when we saw all the articles and news space for reports from Mumbai and other parts. So the response to this was that we set up post-COVID clinics. I mean, the government of Kerala has been proactive with respect to all these things. So when news came in from other parts of the country that you know there could be a lot of lung sequelae in COVID uh, and other uh, problems as well. So we were very proactive in setting up our post-COVID clinics even before the cases started building up. So the clinics were set up, a very clear-cut guideline was issued by the government of Kerala on how the clinic should be set up. It should be a multi-system you know, uh, disease covering clinic and all the guidelines are there on setting up the clinic and what kind of diseases should be coming there and what should be done there. And also a lot of emphasis there on recording and reporting. But the problem is that, you know, even though all uh, it, it came down to the pulmonary medicine departments in all colleges in Kerala. So even though all of us set up our post-COVID clinics uh, and we did place registers and uh, in, in case in many, in, like if you take Trishur, we kept a, kept a long form, there was a four page form to fill up the data. But then more and more cases of COVID started coming in and more and more responsibilities for the small pulmonary medicine departments came in. And then the uh, time and effort that would be put in for filling these forms reduce as would be expected and we did not really have any support staff for data management data collection and all that so that work suffered the uh, clinical management is definitely continuing but the collection of data which is extremely important and should be maybe even more important or equally important did not really happen to the extent that was needed but having said that the small numbers that we had i just took the data from trishur in fact uh, dr murli cp was uh, responsible for the clinic uh, he was a bit surprised when he saw the data that after the hundreds of patients that he saw there, the finally the good quality data that we could extract was only for two patients. So it's a small number, but among the patients who came there, you can see that majority, 82% came with breathlessness, and about 58% came with cough. The rest of the symptoms are, uh, the list is long, but if you look at some of the common symptoms expected like anxiety or uh, nausea, which are more common in the other studies from Western countries, not com that common. This might be a biased sample because probably somebody with anxiety or somebody with a cardiac disease or somebody with myalgia, tiredness, fatigue and all might go to a different OP. They may not necessarily come to the post-COVID clinic run by the respiratory medicine department. So there is a kind of bias in the data, but still this is what we have in our post-COVID clinics at the college level. Of course, uh, you know, even the primary health centers are running clinics and uh, the data from there needs to be analyzed to find out what would be the real proportion of the population. There. Now, the management strategies, what is there in the guidelines and what would commonly be uh, done here, like uh, Dr. Eleanor just told us, there isn't really a very clear cut guideline on what should be done. But obviously, the most important one is pulmonary rehabilitation. If you saw her slides, you know, it's quite uh, interesting to see that at the end of it, towards the management, she would say that the pay patient was referred to the rehabilitation center where you know the rest of it she assumes that the rest of it would be taken care of there but unfortunately for us we really don't have that kind of rehabilitation centers i'll be touching on that later briefly the pharmacotherapy of course steroids uh, play a very important role but again our problem is that you know most of our patients have already got steroids when they come to us uh, as dr eleanor told us steroid might be part of the problem so can we keep on adding more steroids in that case you know it's the easier option available for pulmonals to give inhaled corticosteroids. The evidence is not really there. The evidence is there for actually uh, giving it early in the disease to prevent progression. But then, you know, this is an option that we have. And with uh, lesser side effects, we do try it out. Antifibrotics are something which have been tried out a lot, particularly in the private sector in India and to a lesser extent in Kerala. But again, if you saw Dr. Elinor's slide, you would see that Nintinanib, which is uh, the most common one tried out in India, she has uh, put in a slide that, you know, due to side effects, they even stopped the trial there. I, hadn't, I haven't read that, so it's new information for me. But definitely these drugs are also tried out. A lot of people have a hypoxemia following their disease. Even after discharge, they are on long-term oxygen therapy. Some centers in India have even gone, gone for lung transplant. This is an option that we don't, really don't have in our part of the country. So like I said, the most important part of uh, management would be pulmonary rehabilitation. 
And, uh, you know, I am a great fan of pulmonary rehabilitation. There's a lot of evidence for pulmonary rehabilitation and chronic respiratory diseases. And this should be theoretically doable in our country. I mean, we have so many healthcare workers and staff to support us. So it should be possible. The government of India and the government of Kerala were proactive in bringing out guidelines for establishing pulmonary rehabilitation clinics uh, for management of the post-COVID uh, scenario. And in fact, uh, the guideline document is there, so, but there are problems there. You know, if you look at the guideline document, for example, if you take the top point here, you know, uh, a person who has uh, persistent cough, you see patients coming to our OP who keep coughing and they can't even talk to you because they keep coughing and it's a paroxysm of cough. They can't stop their cough. But the guidance is that you teach them breathing control. I mean, as a pulmonologist, uh, my worry is that this patient is having a paroxysm cough. He's not even able to hold his breath. So how do I teach breathing control to a patient like that? You know, so breathing control exercises are definitely not possible in a patient who can't stop his cough. Similarly, the next one, you know, talks of uh, practice of yoga, sana, pranayama, and meditation. I am a big fan of yoga. I used to do yoga when I was younger until my cervical spondylosis prevented me from doing it now. But, you know, having done a lot of yoga, still I don't consider myself an expert in training people on doing yoga, sana, or pranayama, or meditation, or things like that, where I, I would feel that expert is needed for that. If you take pranayama, for example, breathing exercises, Theoretically very good, but the fact is that the commonly taught pranayamas in yoga classes, wherever I have attended, where I heard from other people, are analoma, viloma, and kapala bhati. Now, kapala bhati is a rapid, violent respiration that is part of yoga. And with the patients having pneumothorax, I mean, if a patient did a kapala bhati, there is a huge possibility of pneumothorax. And Dr. Eleanor was telling us earlier, do no harm. So we really don't know whether, you know, some of these pranayamas would be applicable to our COVID patient. So there, there's still a need to find out whether, whether these things would be extremely beneficial or not. Now, I am a big fan of leisurely walking as part of pulmonary rehabilitation, which is there in the guidelines, which theoretically is possible to do in our setting. But again, we had such prolonged lockdowns that you, people could not go out of their homes. So, you know, even an evening walk was difficult during this period that we had. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you look at the rest of the guidelines, also talking in terms of group sessions, of yoga and meditation in a scenario where you have lockdowns and almost every kind of center is closed down. I have friends with, you know, well-off friends who had COVID and who had post-COVID problems from Mumbai or Bangalore, and they were actually doing online yoga classes. But when I look at the rates that are charged, I'm sure that the majority of population in India cannot afford those, those kind of online classes. I have my own data with, for COPD. Now, see, for COPD also, you know, pulmonary rehabilitation is something that is really recommended and we all are in, in favor of doing pulmonary rehabilitation. But when you take the ground reality among pulmonologists, you know, treating COPD patients, you will see that only less than 1% of the COPD patients in Kerala have access to a structured pulmonary rehabilitation program. We really don't have those, those kind of setups. So what Dr. Eleanor, I mean, Dr. Eleanor was telling us, you refer to a pulmonary rehabilitation program, but then even for COPD, less than 1% of our patients have access to such programs. So even for COVID, the same applies if you want to refer to a program. There aren't many places which actually run programs like that. So that is a problem. But the good thing is that in Kerala, we have been proactive even before COVID came in. And for the first time in India, for COPD and asthma management, a public health kind of program was uh, developed in Kerala. This is the only program in India at a state level which runs COPD and obstructive airway disease care at primary care level. And as a part of this, we did set up pulmonary rehabilitation clinics in primary health centers, you know, and capacity building of doctors and nurses in those centers was done for pulmonary rehabilitation. But this was done like five years back. And for the last two years, everyone is, you know, after COVID. So I really don't know how much of effort those doctors and nurses today would be able to put in for pulmonary rehabilitation. But the infrastructure and the HR is there in Kerala. So it is doable, but it's a, it's a question of, you know, putting in the kind of effort that you need. Now, the most common symptom is dyspnea. So patient comes with dyspnea. Generally, you know, with the crowded OPs that we have, without much of evaluation for the milder ones, we would just be giving them symptomatic treatment in terms of bronchodilators and pulmonary rehabilitation. Again, with all the problems of accessing pulmonary rehabilitation. Then the next step, obviously, would be to give inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist, which is something, again, which is available. Uh, it's not so costly. Uh, hospital pharmacies do have these uh, inhalers. So that is something that we do try out. And then if it doesn't really work, the ideal case scenario, if you saw Dr. Eleanor's slide, you talk, talk in terms of pulmonary function, but then because of the risk of spread of uh, COVID, uh, the government had put in an order stopping pulmonary function testing the spirometry in most institutions in Kerala. So, you know, with, with respect with the problem of infection control, we really are not doing pulmonary, uh, pulmonary function testing. 
Now, many other centers in India, many other centers are doing impulse oscillometry, which doesn't involve so much of a effort, and it uh, does pick up uh, even small airway disease in patients with uh, post-COVID syndromes. So, you know, that is feasible, but we really don't have impulse oscillometry in any of our colleges in Kerala. So, you know, we are limited by infrastructure also. CT thorax uh, is something that we don't want to rush and do because many of the patients in the early part of, you know, like one month or one and a half months after after COVID, uh, you, they, they would actually have, uh, you know, they would actually have restoral lesions. And that, so we, we want to wait for some more time before we take a CT scan. When to take a CT scan is a big problem. Whether we can take a series of CT scans to look at progression is again something that is difficult for us. Now, we are tempted to give a course of oral steroids, but these patients have got steroids for long. So do we continue steroids and then for how long? But at times that is all that we are able to do. Now, do we consider antifibrotics? I'll come to that because that is very common in other parts of India. In addition, we look for other causes like thromboembolism and cardiac causes also. Now, with, you know, if you look at uh, inhalers, for example, you know, in the beginning, the guidelines came in with a negative recommendation against inhalers, but international organizations said that inhalers are essential for patients, particularly those with asthma and COPD. And then the guidelines changed, and now inhalers are recommended in our category patients. I mean, this one, I'm just putting into end just to highlight the fact that guidelines keep changing and we really need more of uh, data and uh, evidence to say what, what to use. Now you see the CT scan of this patient, you can see the extensive involvement. You see a crazy pavement kind of appearance with the, you know, uh, uh, with the septal thickening and the ground glassing extensive in this patient. If you look at the slides, uh, all these pictures, uh, extensive ground glass. I must tell you, this is not COVID. This is a H1N1 patient from about five, six years back who came with a disease like this. So we, we are used to treating patients like this. And a patient like this, either with uh, you know uh, monitoring or with steroids, you would expect this patient to improve and the whole thing to clear. But early in COVID from Mumbai, you know the experience started coming in. People started talking, radiologists started talking, Mohan sir is a radiologist himself, he might comment on this, that the, uh, the lung involvement in COVID is different. There is a lot of vascular involvement. So it will not clear like your H1N1 pneumonia or other viral pneumonias. But, you know, we still haven't studied that well enough to know whether it's clear or not. What we had is the initial report from uh, Dr. Udwadia, and this one, he showed these kind of pictures, starting with uh, ground glassing and then going on to honeycombing and traction bronch cases, where he said this is going to happen in a majority of patients, and then that uh, article on tsunami of uh, post-lung fibrosis came in. So in the beginning, we all got worried, is this what is going to happen to all of our patients, and should we be worried about it? I don't really have a series of, you know, uh, CT scans like that. So I'm, I was forced to borrow from the uh, from other articles on that. So what you have is, uh, if you see this particular patient's CT uh, series, which I put uh, download, you can see that it started with ground glassing and ended up with uh, honeycombing in a limited area. Whereas there are other patients, this one with COPD, <laughs> where there was initial ground glassing and all that, but it cleared very well with time. So now we understand that many of these, uh, you know, lesions do clear. And in fact, I had a call to all the experts in and around uh, uh, our institutions in the private sector and in the government sector in Kerala on this issue. And the opinion generally was that uh, even in COVID, it is actually clearing in our patients in Kerala. It is not persisting. It is not really going in for honeycombing in a uh, uh, significant majority of patients. It does happen, but it's not very common. So that brings us uh, to the treatment of uh, you know, lung fibrosis, the antifibrotics. Do we really use it? So on one hand, you have patients like this with extensive ground glassing, honeycombing already occurring. So now you're worried whether the lung would go in for extensive fibrosis, whether the patient would become a respiratory cripple. So at this point, uh, every doctor is tempted to start antifibrotics. At least some of us in the government sector are a bit reluctant because we really don't know. We don't have the evidence. Dr. Eleanor was telling us that the trial showed that it is harmful and they stopped the trial midway through. I have to read that, but I haven't read that. But... <clears throat> The other side of the story is that if you don't really intervene, the patient could go in for extensive lung fibrosis and then you would have a respiratory cripple who might need a lung transplantation as the last option. So do we start it? But that is a debatable issue. We really don't know what to do there. The other scenario is you have a patient like this where you can see that you have ground glassing and consolidation where the automatic response in a patient like this in any other viral disease would be that I would treat the patient with steroids. But the problem in our COVID patients is that this patient, by the time he comes to me, he would have got a lot of steroids already. So despite the steroids, he still has a lung lesion. So do I give him more of steroids? How much of steroids? For how long? I really don't know. And there is a school of thought. I mean, a lot of pulmonals in North India, in East India, 
in uh, Mumbai who would say that uh, this patient might end up with fibrosis later if you keep giving steroids. So maybe we should start antifibrotics early. It is difficult to predict who would develop fibrosis and who would not. So giving antifibrotics is justified. I mean, that is even more debatable. I definitely would not su subscribe to a view like that. I would say that I would just limit to steroids or you know, other management rather than jumping to antifibrotics. The last one is something that I totally disagree with, and that is a patient coming with uh, COVID and end ending up in the ICU with the mechanical ventilation or NIV. And uh, Dr. Eleanor actually told us that these are the ones who are going to develop uh, uh, symptom persistent symptoms, more, more likely to develop persistent symptoms later. But even these patients, you know, most of them might resolve fully, but uh, when they remain symptomatic, uh, you could still intervene. But there is a tendency among three doctors at the ICU level itself that at the time of this they would just start an antifibrotic empirically, assuming that this patient would develop fibrosis. That is something that we really can't agree with because those drugs are not really safe and they could actually have a lot of uh, side effects as well. So it's a very tricky situation. The uh, you know, jury is not out on whether they should be given or not. And people are practicing it left and right uh, the way they like it in India as it's with many other uh, treatments. Now, I, I really like the way Dr. Eleanor stopped her presentation. In the midst of COVID, you forget other things. So, you know, many of these patients come like this. We had this nodular lesions. We had the consolidation. Everything put together. And the smear, uh, you know, the smear for uh, uh, the NAT for TB actually came as indeterminate result. It was not valid, the test. But uh, it, the smear showed a fungus. But our microbiology department, Trishur, was alert to tell us that that fungus doesn't appear like uh, mucormycosis or anything like that. So they they said, let us look at it further before we take action. But we had to cover the patient with antifungus. And then when we repeated the NAT for TB, this patient turned out to be a case of tuberculosis. So in India, you have to think of other things where you might you know, miss those diagnostic thing, looking at the X-ray, looking at the CT scan and thinking that this is all, you know, this is all uh, COVID. It could be something else as well. The, thing, uh, the same thing was reported in one of our recent meetings in uh, Trivandrum where all district TB officers had come in. So a series of cases from various districts of Kerala where, you know, a period of uh, one month to two months after COVID, they had persistent symptoms. And when they were valid for tuberculosis, they all turned out to be tuberculosis. This is just a tip of the iceberg. We really don't know how many, how many tuberculosis cases we are missing because we are thinking that it is uh, COVID. So, you know, we have to think of other things as well from our country scenario, from our state scenario. So I'll end, it, end by saying what can be done from the university side. So one, we really need the data. Dr. Eleanor also is talking in terms of clinical trials. Clinical trial is one step further, but at least a kind of uh, cohort study which looks at uh, what really happens to the patients. Do they really need all these medications before which we don't, really don't have any evidence? We also need community level data. You know, all, all the data that is coming right now is from the post-COVID clinics and particularly the respiratory symptomatics might be coming to these clinics. So we really need to know about other manifestations of long COVID as well. And for this, uh, you saw the very beautiful slide that she had put up where you had the multidisciplinary teams coming in. So you have, uh, you know, these multidisciplinary teams are needed because you have various kinds of uh, symptoms uh, and uh, you need standardized guidelines on management, including all those symptoms. The teams should include pulmonology, psychiatry, physical medicine, dietitian, and the list is long, you know, cardiologists, so many other specialists might be needed. Uh, the logistics of managing a big team was already discussed by Dr. Eleanor. It's a, it's a challenge to get doctors in this uh, you know, era of uh, everyone being busy with COVID. But we also need support if uh, we are going to recommend yoga, pranayama, and all that. We might need support from the Ayush side. We need uh, our nursing uh, schools and nursing colleges to teach more of pulmonary rehabilitation. Even uh, colleges teaching physiotherapy do not really teach uh, pulmonary rehabilitation. They focus more on neuro rehabilitation and uh, you know, ortho rehabilitation. Most of our physiotherapists have no idea about pulmonary rehabilitation. So that is also the curric curriculum and uh, how you could train people on that is something that uh, we could consider. Thank you for the patient listening. Uh, sorry, I lost track of time. I, I'm not sure how much time I took. Uh, I think, Thank you, Sanjeev, uh, sir, for uh, uh, describing the ground reality in Kerala. Uh, we will uh, move on to the uh, last topic, which is probably mu much more important, the psychiatric uh, aspects of COVID, post-COVID uh, syndrome. Uh, it will be dealt by Dr. Vidhu Kumar, Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. Over to you, sir. Uh, 
slides are visible audio is not there yes 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 yeah. visible Vidhu Kumar, you can unmute. Okay. Uh, Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Thomas, Thomas Aib, sir, and uh, Dr. Raj Mohan, and all of the dignitaries. Today, what I'm going to discuss the mental health aspects, psychiatric aspects of the post-COVID scenario. And the first part of the presentation, I'll be uh, emphasizing what other speakers have alluded to, uh, emphasizing the psychiatric uh, symptoms and disorders as part of the post-COVID uh, 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 psychiatric uh, syndrome. And uh, the second part, uh, probably a larger, uh, aspects on the mental health scenario after COVID. So, this has been a uh, study which had been done in Arnavala Medical College during the acute uh, uh, COVID phase in isolation wards. And it had been found that uh, anxiety and depression are seen approximately 23 and uh, around 20 to 23 percentage of patients. This had been the acute COVID scenario. And uh, it had, the time had passed, we have more time and so many patients uh, had passed through the, this uh, period of uh, COVID. And uh, the research, uh, we have some uh, uh, experience from, actually when I review the literature, Actually, the post-COVID syndrome is new. We have some experience from the, uh, the previous COVID epidemics, and it had been found that many of the psychiatric symptoms which we are seeing, like insomnia, anxiety, uh, concentration, memory impairment, depression, confusion, irritability, etc., all were part of the post-COVID phenomena in MERS-COVID and SARS-COVID in the previous epidemic periods. And what is striking is probably with the uh, the current uh, uh, COVID, probably the, the prevalence of these disorders, exam, example, for example, memory loss and uh, impairment in attention, three months after post-discharge is much more than what had been there in mes covid and SARS-COVID. As also, uh, depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms are much more uh, reported in uh, the, the current uh, COVID-19 uh, as the post-COVID phenomenon. Now, um, but one of, the, one of the problem is that uh, we have to differentiate between symptoms and syndromes. Actually, some of the symptoms like uh, fatigue or depressed mood doesn't indicate that it's a clinical depression per se. So that could be the, the higher percentage of uh, around 30, 38 percentage of patients depressive symptoms and around 40 percentage report anxiety symptoms. But when it comes to the depressive disorder per se, it is much uh, comparably less, and it, it constitutes around 20% to anxiety is more, around 30% uh, anxiety and 20, uh, just over 20% of depressive depression. But also, another conservative estimate had found that uh, the incidence of any psychiatric diagnosis in 14 to 19 days after COVID-19 diagnosis was 80.1 percentage uh, and uh, including actually the new onset symptoms were only 5.8 percentage and uh, the breakup of depressive disorder anxiety disorders were 9.9 and 12.8 so there sh we should be able to differentiate symptoms from the syndrome per se and when you take the depressive disorder or anxiety disorder per se it is comparably less than the symptoms and this had been shown already by uh, uh, dr elena and uh, 
actually i just uh, i will use this slide just to emphasize the different uh, uh, symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, which are seen during the later part after the week after week twelve, are anxiety, anxiety and depression, sleep disturbance, and PTSD. These are the primary uh, psychiatric symptoms which are reported uh, consistently in the literature as regarding the uh, as this regarding the psychiatric disorders during the post COVID period. And some of the predictors which have been identified in this literature is one is already rightly said in the previous uh, uh, talk, the male gender, the severity of infection, and when the family members, more family members are affected, and uh, the post-infection uh, physical discomfort, severe, uh, okay, that had been said, uh, continuous or elevated inflammatory biomarkers and prior psychiatric history are said to be some of the important predictors for the, these uh, anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And this also a, a replicated site. Again, I am showing, uh, and already Dr. Sajeev, and everybody was uh, telling about the post-COVID care clinic, and the psychiatric also should be part of it, and it should be screening anxiety, depression, PTSD, sleep disturbances, and cognitive impairment should be the focus. And uh, we need to include, we need to develop scales for that. Or uh, actually, whether the, the current uh, instruments we are having for screening is adequate to screen a COVID-19 uh, post-COVID symptomatology, that is also we need to discuss about. Now, one of the queries, which I, when I went into literature, and as, as well as uh, from the anecdotes of cases which are seen in a tertiary care clinic, uh, are we fitting, at least regarding psychiatry, are we trying to fit uh, the existing post-COVID symptoms into stereotype syndromes? And uh, some of the observations which I had made, and also from the literature, there had been a higher incidence of psychotic symptoms in the depression, and there is marked motor agitation and a clear neurocognitive deterioration in patients, in depressed patients, and profound changes in sleep-wake rhythm and resistance to pharmacology. For example, some of the depressions we see in the OPD do not respond primarily to a typical antidepressant regimen. The extreme fatigue, headache, speech and swallowing dysfunction, concentration, concentration difficulties, muscle weakness, dizziness, apathy, uh, generalized hyperalgesia, difficulty th thinking, processing, uh, referred to as brain fog, or confusion, and anxiety. So, a lot of symptoms, whether we should be able, we should be fitting into a, a known syndrome, we need to think about. And we need to develop probably scales, we need to construct, uh, we have to see what we can do. And uh, again, in this scenario, uh, already it had been said probably uh, all these, even the psychiatric symptoms of post COVID also could uh, be resp as a response to. A uh, hyperinflammatory uh, response and a maladaptive glial recovery is one of the post plays which have been seen, and uh, that had been the, the that, that could be replicated across disciplines and probably psychiatry also could, psychiatry disorders also could be could be because of that. Now this is regarding the disorder syndromes, but we should not already. Doctor uh, Chandani had alluded to that a lot of suicides happen happen, and we have depression. We have anxiety. We will not be able to pinpoint anxiety and depression to biology alone. And there are a lot of uh, psychosocial phenomena happening around. And uh, this also should be taken into consideration in research, as well as in policies, as well as in practice, because we are not able to, especially at least as regarding psychiatry, we are not able to delineate the psychosocial factors from biological factors uh, causing the uh, symptoms. For example, quarantine uh, will produce anxiety, depression, post-traumatic symptoms, alcohol abuse, behavioral changes, and uh, there had been one of the symptoms which had been uh, uh, reported is cautious and compulsive hand washing, and social distancing, which had produced has produced the loneliness, uh, anxiety, depression, domestic violence, and child abuse and substance use in the community, and there is a syndrome which is actually a culture-bound syndrome which had been re reported in Japan. 
in which uh, people tend to isolate themselves and they tend to remain in their rooms and uh, homes. They don't, don't want to come out. And uh, probably we are actually also having similar syndrome, like a hic this is not a hikikomori syndrome, like a syndrome, and probably the post-COVID scenario also might have contributed to such a similar syndrome. And you know very well that internet behavioral addictions and suicides are happening around. And uh, from the newspaper reports, uh, again, we are seeing from the personal experiences also, you might be seeing that some of the, uh, uh, some of the events that are happening are these like internet behavior addiction and suicide. So in this context, uh, some of the recommendations on one of the reviews is information is the key. And what actually, uh, in, 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 instead of uh, volunt instead of compul uh, compulsory or uh, enforced quarantine, voluntary and altruistic quarantine should be emphasized. And quarantine should be relatively short and support programs and mental health first aid are important. Uh, considering the larger aspect, the so, so, psychosocial aspects contribute into uh, mental health issues. And uh, we, we know very well that post-COVID-19 uh, had caused a lot of, lot of economic recession and there have been social inequalities and uh, it had a terrible impact on mental health. And that also probably should be considered while we discuss about the mental health issues during the post-COVID period. And now this uh, should be a causal model, which could be uh, important. For example, there could be unemployment, pay cut, economic recession, quarantine, domestic uh, women, children, violence, stigma, all these produce as a psychosocial stress, and that can produce maladjustments, mental distress, trauma, mental illness and self-harm, deviance and irrational behavior and family disintegration. So we need to consider the psychosocial aspects also during the post-COVID period. And also that will be important, especially in mental health and in research as well, probably, probably the confounding factors, uh, when you look at, for example, depression, anxiety, when you see this also should be taken into consideration. And uh, this is probably a conceptual model and in, in, in this model probably biology should also be added and these are the proximal factors like uh, family issues stigma uh, health to pick conditions economic crisis etc distal factors like fear of infection work pressure information overdose overdose uh, lockdown and social isolation and of course we have certain protective factors like positive thinking spirituality, family support, community support, all these are the protective factors. And with the biology of the post-COVID syndrome, the outcome is poor mental health or bad mental health. So some of the suggestions uh, which I, uh, I which, uh, which comes up, allaying poverty and other social measures is probably important our, and our governments are doing a lot in this direction. And practical consideration as reducing a logistic uh, reduction in the quarantine period to reduce the isolation and helplines. Actually, the mental health uh, uh, health service department is offering helplines, and uh, probably that will be important in crisis management as well as uh, uh, as will be important as a first psychological first aid. IEC activity is also important. Yoga and spirituality is important, and COVID care clinic should be part of it, as uh, reported earlier in this session by Dr. Shaji and also by the speakers. Probably we need to concentrate on post COVID uh, cohorts, and uh, we have to delineate syndromes. We need to identify, characterize those syndromes. And uh, lastly, there should be measures to allay the distress among the uh, frontline health workers. Actually, we should not forget whenever. We consider the post-COVID scenario, we should not forget about the impact on the frontline health workers also should be part of the scenario. This is a, it's a larger aspect as regarding mental health during the post-COVID period. Thank you. Thank you, Viduma sir, for uh, emphasizing the psychosocial aspects as well as the non-biological component of the post-COVID syndromes. I think um, we will uh, take questions from the chat box.
there are many questions. Uh, can I start by asking Eleanor about uh, the antifibrotic, which uh, Dr. Sanjeev Nair had uh, mentioned? What is your take on uh, the antifibrotics? Thank you again, and sorry if I went over and made everyone else rush, but your talks were so interesting and, and I learned so much just listening to the rest of you. This is the beauty of, um, <laughs> of the light maybe or the silver lining of this pandemic that we're all able to talk and collaborate. And so thank you so much. Um, I, think, I think he said it very well. You know, a lot of people are very concerned about preventing long COVID. People want to do something, but these agents really have very specific uses and you can't start them without knowing exactly what you're treating or without an indication, you can do harm. And so you really wanna make sure that a patient has fibrosis, has pulmonary fibrosis before you start treating treating with an antifibrotic agent. I think some of the things that people are, are trying have been, have been associated with real harm or at best with you know, giving false hope. And so it is important that we really make sure that we are using things that have data and that are indicated. So what about prolonged steroids? I have, I have seen so many patients who come in with secondary infections because of steroids and, you know, steroids have very specific indications. They say, you know, we have, we have shown that, um, it's been shown in some of the initial publications that they seem to only offer a benefit when patients require oxygen or, or are hospitalized. But that said, I have seen so many patients who've come in, you know, after being diagnosed at an urgent care center and gotten an outpatient course of steroids, a Medrol dose pack for four or five days. And then we see those patients with, with super infections. Um, we, are, we have also seen several patients who have something called Kappa, the COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis, which is probably partly associated with this, the, you know, the sort of extensive steroid courses that some of these patients have received. So, it, you know, again, it, if indicated, it can really help decrease mortality, decrease in, in, uh, in intubation and really improve outcomes. But if we start to just give it too, too readily, then I think there can be side effects and we need to really be, um, be upfront with our patients that, that some of the things we do do have risks. And they need to. We need to make sure that we're offering things that that are um, that are really indicated. And I think Dr. Nair did a good job of discussing that as well. Uh, well, we have been seeing more of mucor than aspergillosis. For example, oh, yeah. skin is uh, mucor than aspergillosis. Uh, do you Which encounter more? Aspergillosis? A million times scarier, right? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. And do you encounter more aspergillus than mucor? We, I have personally seen, I have seen probably twice as much or three times as much aspergillus as mucor, but I have seen one mucor patient, but you know, that was a typical mucor patient, person with diabetes and with some iron storage. So really a setup for, for mucor, um, but you absolutely do see regional differences in all the endemic fungi. So I, I'm not surprised. And especially with, with the steroids, I think it's, it's um, something we need to really keep in the forefront of our minds because those are infections that can also get out of control very quickly and have really terrible outcomes. I think we'll uh, open questions. Uh, anybody can unmute and ask questions. Oh. I can request uh, Shaji sir to give his comments on the psychiatric aspects. Uh, sir, unmute, please unmute. Yes, un unmute. I think neuropsychiatric side effects may be much more than what we really see now. Many states of anxiety and depression may have neurobiological basis. Obviously, the whole population has more anxiety and depression during the pandemic, but then in post-COVID scenario, if people develop anxiety and depression, which are persistent, we need to probably also consider that this could be organic in origin. Uh, another concern would be many patients develop delirium, especially when there is severe illness. There could be subclinical delirium. Delirium is something which we miss, especially people who are 
not trained in neurology or psychiatry or clinicians across the globe miss delirium very frequently so delirium is a misdiagnosis so that is something which can have longitudinal effects uh, on population and uh, so i think depression is one possibility following a viral infection which has some predisposition to involve the central nervous system so that it will be interesting to see how depression and cognitive depressive symptoms and cognitive symptoms evolve over time uh, following a covid infection and it will be very interesting to see if uh, severe covid infection leads to more persistent cognitive and depressive symptoms in that subset of patients so i think this is something which we need to seriously investigate thank you that's all what i want to wanted to say thank you sir other comments um probably purusha comment sir can uh, mention about the ch uh, children okay sir okay sir uh, i am uh, before coming up to talk about the children i have one comment uh, question to dr elno and i have uh, two suggestions to our honorable vc and dr shaji sir also the first comment uh, to dr elno is we have been using uh, the monoclonal antibody cocktail we have been using over the last one one and a half years of the remdesivir antiviral drugs and we are getting more better results in the when you are using this uh, the, this uh, cocktail monoclonal cocktail in highest risk cases so those uh, uh, things are preventing the entry of this virus into the system so you said the incidence of uh, long covid is irrespective of the, the the symptomatic nature but severity cases are more so what about the situation where the virus is not allowed to enter at all so is there any study of the this category of uh, people where the the monoclonal uh, uh, cocktail were used where the number less because the viral multiplication if you are blocking whether the, those subset has got a less uh, a chance of uh, the post covid situation that's the question to dr elnor and the suggestions and recommendation at the end of this five days kohas can have a recommendation for the policy matter in the long covid gives a chance of uh, the medical education which i am concerned for the last one and a half years we are worried about the students their uh, their risk here we have got 30 to 80% of the survivors of this in kerala maybe 20 lakhs and that was number of people who have got diverse problems in different systems they won't pose a threat to these students and from them they can serve as good source of teaching material i'll say teaching material in a different quotation because what we lack for the teaching is the patient because there is a chance of giving infection to students they are not allowed to come to the hospital why not we use the post covid good number of patients for teaching so that it will be both ways useful they they will get better care as a the medical students as manpower to serve them at the same time they will give more chance of learning from diverse the effect of this thing in different systems so can we set up a, a different difference in the curricula a little modification maybe for another short while but where the initiative the university can take initiative and some modification can be done so that the teaching can be improved the ug teaching especially and the last part dr shaji sir about the changes of the, the the relevance of ayush dr sanjeev was uh, suggesting and there's definitely there's role for maybe ayush medicines especially for this long covid scenario so uh, uh, whether many number of people are there in the five days of this symposium 
whether they can be involved for the future research activities. About the, um, the, the kids, uh, the, the number of uh, kids having these problems, it is equivalent to the long COVID post uh, scenario. The number is very less. We, we didn't have much of problems, but uh, we had few cases of death uh, due to, not due to respiratory. The interesting thing is that cardiovascular intractable hypotension is the one thing and a few cases of uh, uh, dangerous arrhythmias also. So what we need in the coming months is the, the definitely the, the, the government is uh, already well prepared to tackle the situation but a little bit more of the support is needed. Maybe in the coming months ECMO is the one thing which may be useful to uh, in dire um, situations to say we lost a few cases there maybe ECMO could have saved. And the cardiovascular support in, in, in the right time with the dangerous arrhythmia also, we missed a few cases. The number of death is very low when we take the pediatric cases. Still, there's a need for developing that situation. So thank you, sir. Thank you for that question. I think um, to your first point about the monoclonals, that is something I'm really looking for. You know. Uh, right now, it is so biased by time. There's such a time bias in the data because of when monoclonals became available and how their use was, was followed. It's something we're collecting in my study, and I hope others are collecting what COVID treatments people got so that we can really follow and see if those affect the incidence of long COVID, if the particular mechanism of the different drugs, you know, monoclonal versus antiviral versus immune modulation, whether any of those really are able to impact long COVID. And I think that will not only have implications for prognosis for patients, but also our understanding of the underlying you know, pathology of the disease. So I think that that's something we're all looking for. I, I haven't seen anything yet about that. And, and it's tended to be so dictated by where we were in the course of the, uh, the pandemic and where people were regionally that it's been very difficult to make any kind of conclusion, but I look for that. Um, to your second point about medical students, I love that idea. I love the idea of really training them in an interdisciplinary clinic where we're learning in real time to learn how to apply evidence-based medicine as it's coming out. I think that would be great for training. You know, I I, I think unfortunately we're gonna we're gonna run into a crunch, you know, with all different kinds of providers and you know. As, as people are fatigued by this pandemic, as people just retire in general, you know, as doctors and, and other healthcare providers are affected. And so we're gonna need med students to go into everything, but I think training in this will really help prepare them for everything. And I love that idea. I think, I think that's something we should definitely do. And then to your last point about kids, I'm not a pediatrician, I have to, I don't understand them, um, but you know, I think we're all worried about the implications for children. and. We do know that kids are likely to have less severe disease, but they do have problems like myocarditis. They could be at risk. You know, if it is true that long COVID is, is worse or more prevalent in people who have less symptoms, then children would be an excellent setup for that. And I'm scared of that myself. Um, it's something we're looking at trying to expand our study to in, include, include children. And I know others are doing the same. I know that was part of the FDA's charge when they asked for more data about the vaccinations in children is to also follow up for, for long-term potential complications of breakthrough infections and COVID itself and the vaccine. So hopefully that is something we will also have more data on. Others on the call, I know you probably see children more than I do. So hopefully you have comments about that, but it's something we're worried about and people are, are really paying attention to. There's been a lot of focus on the MISC, the the multi-organ system, you know, inflammatory complications of COVID, one of the rare complications that we really seems like we see in children. And there's been a tremendous focus on that just with the acuity of the presentations. But I think as, if we start to come out of this, as we come out of it, I think there will be much more focus on, on what children experience. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Uh, Suma Madam, uh, what about your experience uh, with uh, COVID and post-COVID? Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Wright. Uh, my experience with COVID and post-COVID, like uh, as has been said here, all the problems we come across in the post-COVID clinics and the post-COVID uh, period. And also for emergency, like uh, Chantani said, all these problems are there since the beginning, but that time we didn't understand that it's a post-COVID. And also a definition for post-COVID. 
that has come up later on only because any anybody going back home and coming with a problem is supposed to be uh, was usually discussed as a post covid syndrome and actually it is not the post covid so now there is a clear idea and we see more and more cases like that i would like to ask a question to uh, sorry <laughs> Aminal Afis, yeah. Sanjeev. <laughs> Eleanor. Sanjeev. <laughs> I don't know. It's just Sanjeev. That is, you were saying that uh, there you had cases of uh, uh, with the honeycombing. But all the experts say that, and also in literature is saying, saying that usually post-COVID uh, lung problem, honeycombing is not a, a usual one. And if there is honeycombing, you have to think about the other things also. So do you mean to say, or we have to expect a, a uh, long-standing uh, case that is different from the others for our people. Thank you for that question. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, uh, in the beginning from Mumbai, they reported a lot of cases with honeycombing, traction bronchitis. And all. This is generally the picture we see in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that is the condition where we use those drugs that we discussed. Now, obviously, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a totally different disease altogether. The mechanisms are different. So, And COVID is such a short-term thing that it cannot explain the same kind of phenomenon. So it is seen, but, uh, you know, we, at least in Kerala, we have found that the proportion of patients coming with the typical honeycombing similar to a idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, much less than what we would have expected from the news that was coming to us from Mumbai and Delhi. So the percentages are less. We are getting, I mean, if you have a broad definition of fibrosis, that is why I put it in inverted comma in my presentation, we do have patients with, you know, subplural uh, linear bands of fibrosis, which is quite, quite different from the honeycombing that we get. And a lot of people with uh, ground glassing, which is persistent. We really don't know whether they had it during their active COVID and how long this would last and how much time we should give it for it to clear naturally. And particularly the ones with uh, ARDS uh, who are on ventilator would have more extensive lung involvement with uh, the kind of uh, you know, crazy pavement picture which I showed for the H1 unknown patient by slide. So something similar would also be there, which is different from the honey. Do you I plan mean, to look more into that? I mean, we would love, I mean, I I had to, as you saw, I had to borrow slides. I did not have my own slides of, you know, three or four serial CTs in a patient because of, uh, you know, the limitations in doing CT scans and uh, the issues there. So, I mean, uh, that is what I was suggesting that we, we have a cohort and at least a subsection of the sub, uh, sample of the cohort, we do take serial CT scans and the radiology department can get involved. And then we will definitely know what, there are studies out there which tell you that, you know, at the end of uh, so many days, what proportion clear at the end of uh, some more days how many clear that particular article that where i borrowed the slides does tell us but we need to know that in our scenario as well. so that okay, information is i must tell you madam that you had pointed out very early in the covid uh, pandemic to me that we should build cohorts yeah. I, I remember that very well and i think that is something that we could not do i think we should apologize yeah. that you know we could not do something the idea was there but you know clinical work and all the other work keeps everyone so busy that uh, time for the data collection and all becomes like the idea is still there, yeah, but I still do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, what about the um, the correlation between the late CT findings and the symptoms? At the end of uh, one month, if you find uh, CT findings, do they uh, correlate with the clinical symptoms at that time? At that point of time. Uh, it was a question to me, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, as Dr. Helena also showed, I mean, uh, there are studies which have shown that the extent of involvement in CT at the beginning may not really correlate with the, you know, post-COVID uh, residual changes. And some of them come with uh, high CT scores of 27 and all that, but they don't really persist for long. So there are modeling uh, uh, articles which have done, you know, looked at various uh, adjusted odds for various factors which might predict which kind of patient would uh, remain with the fibrosis. But uh, I think uh, as of now, uh, it's a bit difficult for us. I mean, if we could predict that this patient is going in for fibrosis, then probably those drugs could be you know, used for that subgroup of patient. As of now, uh, from the national level, that is a consensus. It is uh, almost impossible for us to predict 
which patient is going to develop lung fibrosis. That is the excuse they give for giving antifibrotics to all patients. So it's a bit difficult to predict who is going to actually develop. Absolutely more succinct and, and thorough than anything I could have given. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, suggestions? Hi, sir. Then muted, I think. Hi, sir, you're muted. No? He is unmuted, but his uh, audio has got a problem. Okay. Uh, probably. Yes. It will not audible. Please, sir, actually unmute, sir. Mohan, sir, what is the possibility of uh, you having uh, radiology background also and with, uh, with your advice? What do you feel about uh, so Madam, suggestion of a series, you know, cohort where you take multiple CTs and look at how much of clearance occurs and what is the pattern, time frames and all? I, I definitely, we have to do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we are just postulating it is like that, it is like this. So uh, basic things, what we know is that ground glassing is there, uh, like crazy payment is there, uh, and uh, the, there is no correlation between the symptoms and what you see in the CT. These are all things we know, but uh, that is not enough. Uh, we should have uh, more uh, knowledge. And also, is there any variation <coughs> among our uh, group of patients? So definitely, we have to do it. I think it is possible also. I don't know why it is not. Because it might it, uh, CT is being done, HRCT is being done for many patients. Probably we are not getting the data. That is a problem. <laughs> there is a problem. Any other um, suggestions? If there are no suggestions, I think I should thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor and uh, Rajmohan sir for giving me this opportunity to uh, oversee this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Thomas Aip. And uh, on behalf of the Kerala University of Health Sciences, I thank uh, Dr. Eleanor Wilson profusely. It was a wonderful talk and wonderful presence and you have answered a lot of uh, queries. And I said earlier, uh, now a lot of queries have come out from, and in fact, the university's uh, main purpose was to find out research questions. Now I am flooded with research questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so definitely we will uh, try to and, uh, find answers uh, for uh, many of these. And uh, Dr. Thomas Isaac, thank you for moderating in a very excellent way. And uh, Dr. Chantini, uh, your talk was excellent. Dr. Sanjeev Nair, again, uh, you had a wonderful talk. And uh, Dr. Vidhu Kumar, again, excellent talk. And of course, all those who have made comments uh, today is probably the best day uh, among the uh, la last three days. Uh, I I'm thankful to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.